Boom. Garage. Hola. Hey, keep it in. Cut it out. Kick it out. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live Streams with Famous Friends. I am your host, Jason McNamara, in Tokyo, Japan. Sitting over here is Mr. David Birch in New Zealand. In New Zealand. How are you, Dave? I'm very well, Jason, and yourself? I am actually really, really, really excited about today's show. I listened to these guys when I was growing up, um, and uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think their first album came out in 1986, which I, I was 14 at the time, and I used to love watching video hits shows when I was a kid. I absolutely loved it. I used to used to tape them. I've got, I've actually still got VHSs filled, like three-hour VHSs back home filled with video hits shows, and uh, I enjoyed this band. They they were one of those bands that. Back at the time when I was a kid and I was getting into music, they weren't heavy, so they didn't have that like Van Halen esque thing. Yep. Um, they had kind of like a Beatles esque vibe for me, but with a modern production. Nice. You get what I'm saying? Like yeah. much can, more about I, the I can, song. I can and... see that it's about the song. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and since uh, talking to the guys and getting prepared for this show and catching up, I've been listening to so much of their music, and like my god, it, it it's like opening a. Uh, a lost treasure box, you know. It's it's really cool finding this stuff again and Isn't that fun? checking it out. Yeah, it is. And you, you, you kind fun. of give yourself those musical gifts from time to time. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Like, I've, been, I've been getting quite a few of them recently. It's been quite lovely. Yeah, I know, hasn't it? Like doing this show is great for that. It's just it's making you go back to all this stuff. So instead of sitting here and faffing around and talking about how great they are anymore, let's uh, bring them into the show. So please welcome Peter and Dale from Boom Crash Opera. Hey people, how you going? <laughs> evening, guys. Evening, Good evening, gentlemen. I hope you can live up to the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you were fourteen, my God. Yeah, I was fourteen when you guys started. I think I was forty-three then. <laughs> oh come on, you weren't that old. But like, okay, so, so just to go right back to the beginning, there, like, how did it happen that uh, you guys connected? Were you two the first members of the band to hook up? Well, actually, no, it was Richard and Peter, wasn't it? Mm, if I remember correctly yeah, from reading stuff. Yeah, yeah, it was. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, it was Richard and I who um, wanted to do a band. We'd both been playing in that whole sort of ballroom in a city Melbourne scene, and. Um, we found that all of the bands that we were in kept falling apart <laughs> before they, they ever made anything of themselves. Yeah. And um, although, interestingly, Richard was in a band that eventually became peeled into two and became Big Pig. Remember Big Pig? Oh, God. I, I used to, that, that explains so much about the production. I really get it now. Right. Well, Nick Lornay produced the Big Pig album too, but we're getting nerdy already. And uh, and uh, and Nick Seymour was in a band with Richard, and he ended up in Crowded House, and um, so those bands eventually became something, and I suppose we became something too when we once we found Dale and Maz and Spock. Was this all going down in Melbourne? Yeah, all in Melbourne. Man, Melbourne's such a great breeding ground for music in Australia. <laughs> I think you better yeah. qualify ballroom, Fancy. I don't think it was you were playing ballroom. You were playing in. Chris, it was called the Crystal Ballroom. Crystal yeah. Ballroom, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was okay. you know where the boys, the birthday party, and the early models played, and a whole lot of bands. I'm actually really glad that you said that, Dale, because I'm sitting here going, I'm just imagining <laughs> you guys playing like ballroom dancing music. Because my wife <laughs> ballroom dances, and yeah, I'm thinking, oh, none of her friends are watching. Probably thinking. Do they play a ballroom music? Oh, that's pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, um, got, to, yeah. got to start somewhere. <laughs> Instead of a ballroom, ended up in opera. Great. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, uh, uh, just before we get too far in, I'd like to welcome everybody out there in the chats and uh, and who's watching out there in Facebook and YouTube lands. And thank you very much for spending your Friday evening in Australia with us. 
Uh, I doubt that there's anybody watching in the Americas right now because it's like 3 a.m. in L.A. right now and yeah. I think uh, 6 a.m. in New York. If you are, if you are, prove us wrong. Jump on, say hi. Yeah, um, I agree with that. You know, we've got to love it. We've, we've yeah. got a few that are um, diehard fans that are in there watching these. So Really? Well, well, oh, yeah. yeah. We're actually building a bit of an audience, which is wonderful. And, no, I mean, um, I don't mean you guys. I mean us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure you guys are huge. <laughs> I don't know about you. huge. Well, I can tell you right now, we've got 81 people watching right now across the platforms. And, uh, you know, just as people start spreading the word. So if you actually do want to share this with your friends, uh, please go to our live streams with famous friends by Jason McNamara. That's this guy here. Uh, Facebook page and hit the, uh, the start a watch party button. So that way your friends know you're watching and get them to come over because we are going to do something very special tonight. And uh, I've been chatting with Peter during the week and uh, Dale, Peter and I had a bit of a chat a couple of hours ago and Peter very kindly sent me their backing track that they use live on uh, in the morning. So I've got a session set up here in my computer. I've lined all the tracks up being as nerdy as I am. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> uh, and and so I've lined it up so that I've actually got a mixer set up so we can blend between them and we can mute and, pu- and highlight certain things. And, uh, yeah, it's going to be really fun. Did, did it line up because I changed the tempo of the song? And I fixed it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm that much of a nerd. Yeah, you are nerdy. I had, I did have it at the original. I did have it at the original tempo. I thought, yeah, uh, I didn't give you that one. I actually had to go. It. uh, It was funny because the way I had to cut it up was the initial start from where Dale comes in singing. I had to um, time stretch it. I actually had to slow it down. I actually had to time stretch it to one hundred and two percent. But then from where the uh, cello part comes in, the rest of it I had to set back to a hundred point something. So <laughs> we you just how many right people, over my head. At some, at, at, some, at some point, Dale and I were lost. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the eighty-one people who were online just dropped off. As you know, it's increased to ninety-eight now. So there you go. Oh, there you go. Oh, more nerdy. Oh, there's a lot of nerds around. <laughs> so and now the other thing that I'm going to do for you, beautiful people out there who are watching the show and, and spending your time with us is, and I love to do this on the show. Later on in the show, I'm actually going to open it up that I will uh, send the link to people who want to jump into the show. Have your camera ready. Preferably, please have some headphones on and make sure you mute the sound on where you're watching the show right now. And we're going to give you a chance to come in and ask a question to the guys. So if you've got a question about a song, uh, and I'll tell you right now, I have the button and I'm a very, very straightforward guy. If you mess around, I'll kick you the hell out of there quicker than you got there. So just be respectful and we'll all have a wonderful, beautiful, happy time. <laughs> happy time. It's that, you, you make it sound so pleasant. Happy. Which it is. <laughs> exactly. It is. So, okay, so going from you and Richard, where did Maz and Dale come in timeline-wise to the show? So, Dale, well, actually, Dale, how did you find out about these guys? Well, Maz and I were in a cover band called Survival. Um, we would sort of tour Australia, you know, a little bit, just driving around. And one day we were in a back of a Tarago and Maz, Maz said, uh, hey, listen, I've got this, this this demo from these two guys. And the song was called Up in Arms. Um, kind of funky almost, you know, kind of tune. And I was right, right into Stevie Wonder and all that sort of stuff. And I nice. went, oh, that's pretty good. I like that. It's kind of funky, but in this kind of white... <laughs> uh, <laughs> nerdy kind of way, you know, it was kind of left of field, kind of indie kind of thing. And he goes, that's funny because they're looking for a vocalist and a, and a, and a drummer. So off we went. I tried out with them and uh, they had a bunch of other singers try it as well. But yeah, I got the gig. It was fun. Good on you. Well, look it at how history's inter- worked out. It was interesting because for the first few months we, we were looking for a keyboard player and I, I don't know if you rem- well, obviously you remember you were there, Dale. Um, <laughs> Dale played the keyboards for the first few months. Uh, I'm oh. a terrible keyboard player. <laughs> well, at the time I went, we just need a keyboard player like him. Like, because you got one better. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say you need what a keyboard player who was terrible in his own. No, 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 no. Because I, I, I was, I was kind of rhythmical, rhythmical. You know, you I could not I, I can't read. Well, I can't read music, and I, and I don't know very many chords, but I can, I can jam when I have to. And uh, a lot of that stuff actually made it to some of our demos and, uh, you know. Yeah, look, the key thing, you know, back then there were a few capable musicians in the band. Well, more than a few, I thought. 
And but yet we all because a few of us came from that ballroom scene, you didn't we you didn't want to sound like we had chops. Particularly Maz is a great drummer. Oh yeah. And so we kept looking for keyboard players. We kept having keyboard players come in, rather, who had chops, and we were not in the least interested until this guy walked in. He had really cool trousers on and polished, <laughs> polished leather trousers. shoes. And he was in. He had the trousers he was in. Yeah, well, he, he, had the bottom, yeah. <laughs> he had a wear of tra- he, he had a pair of trousers. And he um I remember um you know, he said, What what key is this in? And we went F sharp, which was our favorite key. And um and yes, I it saw, was. I've noticed that on a few of the songs. And, and I saw him quietly counting Count. out from C <laughs> to where F sharp was on the keyboard. He got the gig. In fact, that night we went on we went on stage and at, the, at Billboard in Melbourne, Dale, where Dale and Maz were doing a covers gig and we ran a couple of songs. Oh, did we? I can't remember that. Yeah, yeah, we but, got up and played. Really? What song did we play? Nothing that ever made the cut, you know. Like oh, was Richard, was making Richard a list or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, list. we were all there. And you I'm just, making a list of yeah. funny questions or something. Yeah, yeah that's that a good one. song you wrote, that one. <laughs> we had a song Great called Saint Stupid. Are you sitting you know, Can you imagine that? I, that didn't make it to anything. That was a great song. I should find the lyrics now. They're somewhere in my computer. Right <laughs> <laughs> oh, you songs go called Saint Sh- oh, well, he wrote a song called Onion Skin, I guess, Saint Stupid, isn't that bad? <laughs> now, I love this comment here from Rebecca Booth because I've got to back this up. Maz is a fucking great drummer. Oh, we can swear? Oh, now you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> Mate, this is an Aussie I'll show. I'll be trying so hard. <laughs> Us, Peter, I'm, 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 it's, it's like impossible to talk without going, oh, Jesus, fuck. That, Dale, Dale, we're... We're after we're after PG times, mate. We're it's all it's all adult time from now, mate. So it's all good. Plus, Except I'm gonna, in America, yeah, well, that's their problem. I'm going <laughs> to warn the audience out there right now. This is an Aussie show. There's going to be more than a few C bombs being dropped tonight. Don't you worry about that. It's just it's uh, part of the vernacular. Look I'm at from Pete's Adelaide. Face, I might live in I might live in Japan, but I'm still from Adelaide. You know? <laughs> I can't help that. It's just going to come. Um. All right. So. Uh, I want to I want to get through this whole concept in my head that I keep trying to picture where you were, where you are, how the arrangements came together. There was a time where you guys were working as a five piece band, right? Yeah, yeah, pretty now, yeah, a long, a long time. time. And, and a long, a now long you time. work as a four piece band with a single guitar. But during your time as a five piece, because I mean, when I read through all the information on the band, and keep in mind that I was a kid back then, so I didn't sort of I didn't get to see you guys in the clubs back in the heyday. Because I didn't turn 18 until 1990. And, of course, you were still going. But, you know, those 80s era shows that were happening with, like, you know, we, you, you get crazy gigs with Chisel playing around the place and you guys playing around the place. And all these bands that I was listening to when I was riding the bus with my Walkman and stuff, I didn't get to go out and see at that particular time. And by the time I got old enough to uh, go out and see a lot of the bands, I was into heavy metal and so my taste had changed a bit. And now as an adult, I had this whole eclectic thing of, you know, growing up on Duran Duran and, and bands like yourselves and, you know, um, God, In Excess. I mean, The Swing is still one of my favourite records to this day by In Excess. Um, and I kind of rediscovered it as I got older, you know what I mean? You you, you sort of go yeah, back yeah. to what yeah. you grew up on. Um, so I missed out on getting to see you guys back in the day at those times. Unfortunately, it's just the way it was. So when you were doing the five-piece thing, I noticed in the recording lists and things like that, it states that, uh, both Richard and you, Peter, were actually playing bass and keys. But how were you touring? Were you with a keyboard player or, or how was it working? No, no. We we actually, I, I don't know what credits you were reading, but the band started with me as the guitar player, Richard as the bass player, Greg O'Connor as the keyboard player, Dale singing, and um, Matt's playing the drums. But Richard was actually a guitar player and really he just copped the bass gig He's a, better, he's a better guitar because he's taller and he could hold the bass, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but you guys, used to, you guys used to swap quite often on stage. Well, you that happened, yeah. Uh, yeah, after the first album, uh, while we were touring the first album, we started swapping instruments during the gigs and eventually we – and Spock, the keyboard player, would come down and play guitar and sometimes play bass as well. So we just kind of passed the instruments around. Uh at much to the chagrin of front house engineers because they said it's very difficult to mix you guys because I'm mixing three bands because every two songs the lineup changes and different people get on different instruments and it is very difficult to pull a sound. But that's the way we did it. 
uh, eventually Richard and I, it, Spock stopped playing the bass. He, can you remember the other day when he came to rehearsal and said, oh, I'm not playing bass, bass anymore. Bass anymore. Neat, 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 neat. You can understand yeah. Spock's sense of humour is kind of crazy, you know. He's a, he is one of a kind, that boy. If I try to remember correctly, because I'm probably going to get it wrong, in my mind, the first song that I think I remember hearing from you guys was either Hands Up in the Air or Great Wall. But what was the first single? The single was Great Wall. It was Great Wall. Okay. Yeah. So just as a – because, like, with this show, people out there watching the show, I love to play the tunes. I love to sit and go through this stuff. So I can't monetize this stuff on YouTube. Um, it's just the way it is because record companies take all that stuff. But uh, I love for you guys and to hope, hear it. So, and hopefully pass it on to the artists, let's be honest. Yeah, yeah <laughs> which they probably don't. Um, but let, let's get in and have a listen to that very first sound that we all remember from when the band first kicked off. Now, there's so much magic just in that intro there alone. Um, I love how, Rich, uh, how Peter's got his guitar there. I almost said Richard yeah. there. That's weird. Um, but uh, that's it. Now, you, when you and I were talking about this the other day, that's, that sound there is obviously the kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare, and the guitar doing exactly what you did just then. But you were telling me there's another element in there, so I'm going to play it one more time. If anybody in the chat is listening and has a guess as to what you think the other element in there that's making that sound is, write it down and let's see if we can get this right. I'm going to play it one more time from the top, and let's have a quick listen and figure out what this magic is because it's so cool. So, the magic, Peter. Let's go. You've got to scratch on the bass as well. It's all four strings. Yeah, you're going to do it for us now, Jase? Yeah, All mate. four strings and a nice, clean chucka-chucka. All right. So I'm just going to reroute my cable over here. Oh, here it goes. <laughs> I might also say there's electric guitar and acoustic guitar at the same time. So there's acoustic, electric, and a bass. And they're all just going, doing that. Chuckin thing. So what he's referring to here, folks, is my bass sound. Oh, oh dry cable. Holy so it's just literally <laughs> holding the strings and doing this. Just got to find the right <laughs> spot where there's no harmonics. Yeah, completely like that. It sounds just okay, Jace, Got it. <laughs> Jace, down here, down this end of the neck. Down the low end. That's now it. You're, now you're, under, you're dragging across this. I'm, I'm trying to shut the harmonics up. This bass has got too many harmonics. <laughs> oh, it sounds just like that. <laughs> it sounds like us in our experimental phase, Dave. Gotta love, gotta love live shows, don't you? All right, let's hang on. Let's change camera so I don't have to hold it up like such a goober. There we go. There we go. We've got that now. Oh, now you look like a rock and roller. No, nah, no, nah, just down on the second fret, mate. Down. Yeah. Don't really notice. Just flat. Flat chat your hands. That's what I'm trying to do. But anyway, you've got your the, the rough is, idea. Well, you also need a really shitty bass, like a, like a pretend Rickenbacker. That's what Richard used to use. <laughs> yeah, can use a good bass. Hey, so, Jace, good bases, yeah, mate. Are you, a, are you a lefty? No, I'm a righty. Oh, it might be just the might be just the latency. Just start, do, do it again one more time for us. Oh, I know what you're going to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all right. It's it was it was reading. No, it's your technique. Yeah, <laughs> it was sounding like you were going backward, back. You know, doing oh, an up, I see. then a down. But it's only the, it's the internet webs playing tricks. So it's so it's the kick, snare, kick, snare, bass doing that, and then the yeah. guitar. Yeah. And hey, then, hey. <laughs> and that guy doing that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I should change my camera back. And that guy there doing that. Except he had. Well, as soon as, as, soon as I heard that, at, at, we rehearsed that, and we, when I first heard that. Oh, this is a great song. Just but Richard just came and said, "Hey, hey," and I started writing lyrics for it. But yeah, that was. Uh... So, can you remember how how did you get involved, Dale, in helping write that? Well, I think we all, you know, we always always play play these new songs. You go, I listen to what this thing I've got, and then Richard goes, "Hey, hey," and dun, 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 dun. and then you know, it probably didn't sound like that. And then, but I heard the hey hey and I went oh that that's great we'll call to arms and that was our first 
first song. And then, I don't know, I think Richard was just kind of lazy for writing, not, didn't want to write the lyric. And I, he wrote a bit of the choruses, and I just thought, well, I'll write the lyric, and it's great. The other thing yeah. that I love that kicks in there is the synth. Like, do you recall, were you guys using Yamaha DX7s at the time, or yeah, I thought so? Yeah, stacked up. Yeah, but also, wasn't Spock playing the wrong note? You guys were playing uh, A's and yeah. he was playing. <laughs> Which yeah, gives it yeah. that, that. No, it, it gives it that discordant. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, no, and I've played that in a couple, couple of cover bands, and they can't get it right because. They're trying to play the right note as opposed to the right wrong note. Right. That's how Spock would play, I think, A, a sharp, is it? Or is it B sharp? Yeah, it's A sharp, yeah. I don't know. I'm not a musician. Mm. Yeah, they want to, yeah, like you know, Dale's singing da 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 and a Spock, the genius keyboard player. So Dale's singing this note, da, and Spock plays this note, da, and, of course, what you get is, you know. <laughs> da, da, that's, da, 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 da. Yeah. that's That's it. That, it erupts. That's the song right there. Yeah. And that's what makes it so magical is like for those of you who maybe played a little bit of piano as a kid or aren't such an advanced musician or don't even play music at all, the idea is that or you have drummer. major or minor. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, come on. You're a drummer and you know all this stuff. I so, do. You know, I'm, 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 I'm special. So majors and minors. So you've got an acoustic guitar in your hand. If you wouldn't mind for us, Peter, can you just play an F sharp major and then go to the F sharp minor? And that note there is what makes all the difference. So a major is basically a happy key and a minor is basically a sad key. And what they did was they blended the two of them together and that's how you get this mighty sound in there, which is this. Here comes the magic note. Oh, sorry. It's coming. So cool. Sing it out there, Jess. <laughs> what the hell made you think to sing about a wall? No, it's about a dam. Yeah, it's about the rear Rick, dam in 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 Hume Weir. It's Hume Weir. The Hume Weir, yeah. Weir. The Hume Weir, yeah. And, and there was some uh, conspiracy thing that it had a crack in it, and any day now it's just gonna. <laughs> flood through, you know, and that's what that's about, a crack. And, but I turned it into a, a relationship thing. This is the issue with being 14 at the time. I didn't pick up on any of that at the time. I had no idea. <laughs> well, so I was, what do you I think you were saying? <laughs> well, I didn't know. I just I just knew that like this chuck it, chuck it, chuck it reverberated. And it was like, damn, this is cool. But it's like I think it was like great. the Great Wall of China or something. Well, know, I, did, I didn't even... About. Funny enough, I've spent time in China since, but uh, back then, I, I China wasn't really on my radar as a kid. I wanted them to use it in their commercial, you know, their great, the great wall cars or whatever it is that they have. It would have been great. <laughs> you would love the money from those royalties. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> what were you going to say, Peter? I was just going to say at the time, oh, well, I was going to say several things, but I, I reckon when... We, uh, great songs, even though as a 14 year old, you had you only connected with Chucka Chucka Chucka. If we didn't do all the work to sort of think about, you know, all the different weird uh, and esoteric obsessive obsessions, then the song wouldn't have had power, you know. It, and I was, was going to ask that now, as an adult, now knowing about music production and knowing about how music is, was that whole chucka chucka concept something that your producer brought to it and made as big as it was, or no, was that just you guys no. and the way you wrote it and jammed it? It was the way we jammed it. That is so. Things cool. always, things always work that better when we jam. As soon as producers got a hold of it, sometimes they just ruined it. You know. Uh, I like Andy's know. comment here. The gated snare definition of the late eighties, and it's oh so yeah, you true. gotta have you gotta have you gotta have your drama gates. <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting when when Steve Brown came to produce that song, he he took a, a quite a dim view of Richard and I, who were uh, quite uppity control freaks at the time, and <clears throat> um, and he just said, "Oh, I know you're into that gated snare thing. Just forget it. You know, <laughs> we're not doing that." So, yeah. so it isn't a gated snare. Although the, I think the version you're playing tonight, Jace, is a, is Alex Adkins' remix, which may have a non well, You can, you can hear it. it. You yeah, can yeah. Hear it yeah. The, you can yeah, hear it when you listen. I'll, I'll play it again.
Nah, it's just a real reverb. It's not gated. It's not gated. It's just that's just a bit of reverb. Yeah, Dave, good tight snare. You being the drummer, Dave, can you explain to the audience out there who aren't drummers what the difference between a gated (laughs) snare is and just a normal snare? Because we're probably losing half the audience going, what the hell are they talking about? Oh, well, you know, a gated snare is is a snare that has to get through a gate. Oh, come Uh, on. Not that that's technically it. Um, it's the closed off sound. It's it's taking away all the excess ring and uh, excess overtones away from the snare by once it's hit to a certain volume level, it allows the sound through, and then the gate closes when it drops down behind that uh, that level of uh, volume again. Very very simple way of explaining a gate, but basically what it is, it opens when there's enough yeah. volume to go through and closes again behind it. And a snare or a drum being an instrument that is fast on the attack and then dies off pretty quick. Gates work quite well for closing them off and then shutting up any extra sound coming through and were used heavily during the 80s to the to their own detriment <laughs> sometimes. Oh, well. come on, any excess we used, to, that, was, that was part of their sound. It, oh, well, that's, that's the whole thing. It, 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 def, it did well, it define Nick, it a lot Nick. of the, the 80s drum sounds. Yeah, it was like, that's what we used to call them, Nick Launay, you know. That's, that that was Nick Launay's big thing, you know. Yeah. That gated yeah. everything. And that's the thing for the audience out there is like when you get a gated snare, it literally has that moment where it hits and then it's gone. That's it. And and that's kind of where it, it kind of has that magic. And that's why that 80s sound really resonates with some people because they grew up with that and it feels like home. That's really what it yes, all down to. It's, it's the best example of it is, of course, Phil Collins playing on In the Air Tonight oh, yeah. or on similarly on Peter Gabriel's The Intruder, which is where – they actually found the sound, and it, it's even on Prince's um, "Kiss." Like, there's a non-lin reverb on uh, the snare drum on "Kiss." It was, you're right, the sound of the '80s. But Steve Brown was wise enough to go, "This has already got a use by, by date on it. We're not doing it." And so it's actually well, what was he wrong? <laughs> it's actually. <laughs> We're so still playing it now. Exactly. <laughs> So if we jump forward to uh, these here are crazy times, which is a very, very, very apt name for what's happening in the world with the problem right now. Man, talk talk about some comeuppance on being timely. You guys were like 31 years ahead of your time, and I think that that's a pretty universal statement, though. But uh, you guys... We say were, these here are still crazy times. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that, that could be the name of another greatest hits collection. Um we uh, we go to a song which actually gave you success in the US, which is pretty cool. Garage. Hey, give it up. Cut it up. Kick it out. Now, for those of you who are paying attention, there's that chucka 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 thing again, except the bass guitar isn't doing it this time. It's just happening with the guitars, right? Oh, I think he I think he was scratching away on the – actually, I played the bass on this one. I can't remember. Yep. I don't think I'd get straight. I'm not hearing bass in there. Beautiful Telecaster sound there with that. Oh, no, no, no. That, that, I think that's uh, a guitar built by James Cargill, Merv Cargill. Oh, really? Merv Cargill, Cargill, legendary yeah. guitar builder. James, oh, his legendary like son. Yeah, no, yeah, it's that, not a telly. Wow. The Cargills are great. Mm. Awesome. When I, I used to work at, at Eastgate Music for Marcello Grassi for uh, three and a half years, and we used to get a bit of work done from the Cargills, and, man, those guys were good at what they did. Well, James came on the road with us, so he was our guitar tech through 89. Oh. Uh, yeah, 89. And uh, it absolutely an insane tour, which we probably couldn't <laughs> even talk about now, but it was out of control. And... um. James built Richard uh, a beautiful, enormous, uh, heavy. very heavy uh, semi-acoustic guitar, and that's that's on that song. I like this comment here. Love, Love me, a, me bit a bit of onion skin. So it, now I, I've always wanted to know this. I'll just leave it playing in the background while we're chatting. What is the story with onion skin? What's the metaphor here? I mean, am I missing something that I just didn't get as a kid? I um I wrote some songs with Simon Austin, who was in Frente, and he said to me, "Hey Pete, really neat, you know, existential metaphysical metaphor with the onion thing," and I just went, "Okay, that sounds good." <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, isn't it? 
Yeah, it is. Well, what, one of the brilliant things that happened with that song was that, that I came into the rehearsal room and sang it to everybody. I can't remember if it was you or Spock or Rich or all of you. Just You just got the lyrics and crossed out every second line. I went, there, that's better. Yeah. And that, that's <laughs> so you had, you, you, I mean, you do have a tendency. I mean, you are a great, one of, the, one of my favourite lyricists. You really are. And, and next to Bowie, you know, so that's you're in good company. But you do have a tendency to write a lot of stuff to sing. I mean, sometimes in, the, in, in some of those demos, there's a lot of stuff to sing. To go, <sighs> so, yeah. It's had to get and, you and in it, the David it, Lee Roth on. <laughs> it, yeah. <laughs> the, the original opening line of Onion Skin of the verse was, these here are crazy times for eager young vegetables. There you oh go. Oh, my God. Dale, you, you go. did a good job. Thank you for not Thank making you. us all have to put up with that. We, we used the vegetable line in another song later on, which was much more existential. Well, <laughs> and, and funny enough, because this is exactly what the next question was that I had ready to go, so it must tie in. Adam Chapman asks, can you explain the rock and roll carrot? Is that related to onion skin, or do you guys have no idea what he's talking about and he should stop I drinking right now? never heard of a rock and roll carrot, unless, unless rock and roll carrot, because we used to call... Because Richard had red hair, so maybe is it that what he means? All right, here we go. This is going to be my first one for the night. So, Adam Chapman, please message the page "Live Streams with Famous Friends" by Jason McNamara. I will send you a link, and you can come in here and try and explain what this rock and roll carrot is that you want to know about, and maybe we can get some clarity and we can get this thing figured out for you. So, what's yeah, the story? Like what's 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 the metaphor and and, and the thing behind it, the whole onion? It skin? is, you know, it is a, a, a pretty. There you go. It's <laughs> have layers. That, that's, that's exactly right. That's, that's thank you, exactly thank you, right. Parry. Thank you. So that's does, it. does this mean that Shrek owes you guys money for inspiration or what? We owe him money. <laughs> well, no, you, Onion Skin was. Oh, he came later. He came later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. came later. Yeah. But um, yeah, that, that's it, isn't it? Because I've seen the lyric, and it sounds like that's what I'm singing anyway. So that that's my take on that song. Yes, so, it's about you know a lot. You know. A loss of soul, you know, what happens to a person who, you know, hasn't got a central sort of soul or value system at their heart. So you just keep peeling away and there's nothing there at the end. That makes sense. You know, and it's funny. Yeah, but, but oh, there's a darling. Here we go. Are we I reading love, these messages this as they're popping up? Yeah, well, you know, Dave and I have control over that. But I like this one here. I'll never forget your darling harbour gig. Um, where you were all on the on a pontoon, it was insanely hot, so loud of us. Uh, so no, loads, no, oh, sorry, so loads load. of us. Sorry, uh, jumped off into the harbour and swam out to the pontoon. Loved it. I think it was 1989. And incredibly dangerous. Yeah, <laughs> we, we wouldn't. Have I mean, that. really. I mean, they were jumping off. There was some of them were jumping off this really, really high bridge that goes over Darling Harbour, and grabbing onto these cables of you know electric cables and stuff that. Yeah. Were, on the pontoon, it was. We were freaking. Out. I, I loved it, but I was freaking out for them. I bet but you yeah, were. that was fun. So one of the things in this song and, and the way it's put together that I really love is one of the things about music that I enjoy so much and that I appreciate about bands like yourselves is when a band does something once in a song and it never comes again and it just makes you go, wow. And it makes you skip back and listen to it again and again and again because you just dig that little thing. It's like, uh, to be crass, because this is an Australian show right now, so I don't really don't give a flying fuck. It's like, if a girl's showing just enough cleavage to be exciting, it's actually better than when you just see everything naked half the time because it draws you in. You get the metaphor I'm going with here. So where's the cleavage in this song? I, I don't the know what you're talking about. The cleavage in this song is, is the Put a couple riff, of onions together. and The bass riff at the end. Here it comes. That bass run there, do 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 do. Well, it's giving away where the song came from. So it's a Hendrix. Sorry, it's Hendrix. So, so in the rehearsal room, Foxy Lady. In the rehearsal room, Richard. I see you already knew this. No, I didn't. But it makes sense now. Sorry, go on. Richard played this. He didn't play. He played this. And it was that was Foxy Lady. He had to drop the third. To hide the fact it was just Foxy Lady, and I played the bass, and I just quoted Foxy Lady. You, you know, it's Foxy Lady. It's 
So how does your run in the no, song? No, it's Hey Joe. Recall? It's Hey Joe. Oh, sorry, Hey Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Hey Joe. Sorry. Hey Joe. So how it's does your songs. run go in that part? Do you recall? Sorry, say like, again, Jason. The, the exact riff that's on on this recording here. Yeah, yeah, it was on the bass. Is that right? Can you just yeah. hold your fretboard up a little bit so we can see it? I think that's right. You have to play it for me again. I haven't played it. No, I, I, but <laughs> I, I like that. Play it. I, it doesn't make enough. the set list. <laughs> well, actually, I did nah. see I did see you guys playing it on um, – there was a, a Triple M thing where they had a couple of songs you guys were doing uh, for Triple M recently, like late last year. And yeah. re- remember those times when you could actually get out and play in public? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that was uh, that was at 7 o'clock in the morning too, but <laughs> Wow. Not, oh, not you... a, I actually had my first beer at 7 o'clock in the morning because I, I can't sing unless I have a – a little bit just a sip just so i can burp and it was just aghast that oh look at dale Ryder, what an alcoholic drinking a beer i'm just having a sip dude yeah. uh, that was that, that was when i first him. rejoined and that, that was that, that was my first gig with you guys mm. wow yeah. oh so I maybe it was not. earlier and i got mistaken no 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 i, I quit for a while but I, I rejoined and that was my first gig yeah i mean you so, could have had lemonade and burped no what's the point of that there's no fun bunch. Could have a bit of fun. Plus, it doesn't and, create headlines. Yeah, there's a shock value, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good friends with Warwick Kaplan. Believe me, I'm learning about shock value. <laughs> how, how could I, Warwick? <laughs> yes, who is probably not watching the show. How is old Was it going? Geez, I haven't heard oh, that name in a while. Oh, Warwick the Wiz. He's good. So. Coming up from there, there's another song on the album, which uh, Peter and I were discussing the other day. Here you go, Chasing the Carrot, Rocket on Peel. Okay, fair enough. I guess Adam's still harping on this whole carrot metaphor. The carrot thing, Chasing the Rock Dream. Exactly. Uh, oh, I don't oh, believe God. I received a message from him with uh, – no, he no, never never sent no, me a message. He, just, he chucked it on the chat, mate. That's right. We'll get to it later. Um, so there's another song that I was uh, going over with uh, Peter the other day when we were having a chat, and it's Dancing in the Storm. And it's a funny thing because I actually own a 12-string, 6-string double-neck guitar and I didn't break it out of the case yet because I, I was going to. I was going to get it ready. I was going to like, and here's my double-neck guitar and here's how they did it. And before I even did it, Peter goes, that's not how we did it. I was like, oh. <laughs> so he burst the bubble on me. But here's a listen to this beautiful song and the sound that I'm referring to. So we'll play it through for a little bit and then we'll get into the discussion behind it. Lying in the dark, I know you are awake. I will not give in, I will not give in. Pulling faces and admitting not a thing. It's a great vocal, Dale. I will Dale. not give in. Yeah. <laughs> I will not give in. Yeah, here's the magic. Now, for those of you who don't get what I'm talking about with a 12-string guitar, the concept is pretty straightforward. You have... 12 strings on the guitar. A regular guitar, as you know, has six. Now, the f- I haven't actually got my double neck out to show you, but the first four strings on the guitar have an octave high pulled up note, which means that even though I'm not... Actually, you know what? I'll just plug into my amp here regularly. Shall I go and get it? That's all right. <laughs> I, I got it sorted. Oh, he's got a 12 string there too. Oh, if he's going, I'm going to go get a cigarette as well. <laughs> 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 oh, I heard something. To- oh, that doesn't matter. There you go. So, so a normal guitar sounds like this. And your guitar? Well, there's, there's that. But there you go. So like he's got string. he's got two octaves at once. So can you play the dancing in the storm riff on that, or is that not in tune? Yeah. Uh, so oh, let's find out. Oh, it's not in tune. That sounds like a banjo. <laughs> not a little. <laughs> but out of my head, Dave. Twelve string. <laughs> Clustering banjo, you know, or a sitar or something. Sounds good. I like it. Rickenbackers are so hard to play. Oh, I they bought because the necks are so skinny. Yeah. I bought this after we recorded the song so I could play the song on the tour. And um, But we didn't use a 12-string on the record. We cheated. Uh, how do I demonstrate this? Yeah, well, this this is where the magic comes in. So for those of you out there who've ever tried to play this song in a cover band and have always wanted to be able to get it right, you're going to learn from the man himself. So the part 
was and then we got another guitar with, and <laughs> he's all, Jason's already over it. And we put a capo. Oh, there it goes. Oh! <laughs> One of Have another glass of wine. One don't of anybody things. say that Boom Crash Opera don't know how to party. <laughs> Now, can I call my wife to get me a drink? Because I'm on one end yeah, of the go house. For us. Go for it. We, we already learned you're an alcoholic from 7 a.m. beers, mate. Oh. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just, I just call my wife. She's in the garage. Go, can you bring me a beer now? Oh, go just... oh, grab it if you want. It's all good, bud. I'll so this, it. yeah, so now I've put this cape on. I'll be back. Got... No worries. No. No. So we've got this high guitar now, and I just we just I just played it here. Boy. And that's how you did it in the studio. Yep. We so used that, that tr trick on that That's how you song. get that doubled up sound. Yeah. We did it on the best thing as well. So, you know. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to mute Dale's mic because for some reason his headphones are too close. Dave, if he comes back, please unmute him because I'll be in the middle of doing something. Thanks, All over mate. it. So that's where this sound comes from. So we'll play this again so you can hear it. <laughs> Hang on, my is, missus just bought me a beer. Thanks, darling. Is that is such a magical thing that mm. you can hear that. And, and I, was, I was really seriously sitting here going, hey, hello. <laughs> <laughs> sneaks and that's, and that's sneaks a cool thing. Is like I, was, I was listening to it going, yeah, it's going to be 12 string. It's going to be great. I'm going to like be going, wow, I'm the guy. And then I realized that I wasn't the guy because I should have heard that you've got and – together yeah. because a 12 string doesn't do that so for anyone who doesn't know what a 12 string deal is these two thinnest strings here are actually having the same note so you've got two of versus the g one mm. above will have this and so it's kind of cool the way that 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 works because it's something that's unusual to, to hear coming out of the sound yeah. We liked we liked a bit of that jangly stuff, you know. We were Smith fans of the Smiths, or maybe Dale wasn't, but the rest of us. Oh, or at least Ma Smiths. yeah, Maz Rich and I were fans of Johnny Mars' work. Yeah, Johnny Mars is amazing. You can hear um You know what hey Pete, you know what I, I thought you ripped that song off from uh that big red mountain. What's that song? Big country. In oh, a I big love country that song. dream stay with and I thought, God he ripped another song off. But it wasn't. Uh, another song. Did you get that, Peter? Well, he did the well, Hendrix. He did well, the Hendrix about, thing. Yeah, yeah. There was the Hendrix thing. I was about to confess that "Hands Up in the Air" really started as, as um, "How Soon Is Now" by the Smiths. Oh know. wow! Why didn't we? We should have kept going with that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, guys. You were about to play "Big yeah, Country." Were you? See what I mean? And you can jig to it. <laughs> And hence the comment that we just had about saying that they can't hear that song without seeing Dale jig to the song. Yeah, well, I love jigging to that song. Such a great song, Big Country. Yeah, that was 1983, yeah. I think. Roughly. That's a great song. He had a great voice, that boy. Oh, yeah, no question at all. See, so I there's some great ones. Sorry. Is dancing, dancing in the Storm got us into a, a lot of a pickle because we knew it was good when we wrote it in 1988. And the Americans heard it, the American record company, and just didn't get it at all. And they just said, oh, wh what are you playing country music for? <laughs> and so we changed it and we, 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 this thing was, we got rid of this. We got rid of, cut it, got rid of it. We did a, oh, really? you can't remember this, Dale, can you? We did a demo of it that where all of that was gone. You sure? And, oh, yeah, I, I remember all this. It, it, remember that studio in um, Balaclava Road that we hired, rented? In 1988, you know Nick. Nick, remember Nick? Oh boy, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I was never in the studio. You, know? you, know, you were I there. Was always, that when really... I was always playing. No, I don't remember. I don't remember cutting all that stuff out of out of dance. Yeah, we made, we made we made demos. We made at least one demo. <laughs> oh. Sorry, Sorry, yes. uh, yeah, that's no, right. Yeah. I, I went to I went there to hear the flash. comment. And the wrong one came up. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this is Justin Murphy, the guy that Dave and I used to play with, who uh, I have a funny feeling he may have played some gigs with you over the years as far as like 
he was a supporter or an opening act. Um, or uh, sorry? Justin Murphy's the dude's name. He's from uh, the Bayswater area down in Melbourne, and uh, we used to play with him. He's a very good singer. His uh, his yeah. band that he had before we joined him was called Heaven Scent, um, but it was like uh, centers in the smell, and um, yeah, great singer, really good songwriter. Oh, well, good. What, what stinks to high heaven? What were they called? <laughs> heaven sent you, asshole. Oh. <laughs> asshole. Oh, there you go. He says it here. Uh, he played with you down in uh, Warrandyte. 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 So there you go. Uh, what, with, with, with me or with Bunkrai Shop? I'm not sure. You'll have to uh, oh, keep have going to... with comments and let us know. Um, Tanya Dale Ryder says, hello, my friends. Miss you oh, all. That's my, that, that's my family. Oh, so the blonde lady that we see in the corner there is the lady who came and bought you the beer. Yeah, my two daughters. From the picture, you have a, uh, a an unusually good-looking family there, Mr. Ryder. Oh, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let, let's They're all adopted. Like, yeah. That wasn't adopted. Dig, that wasn't digging on you. That meant it was in like a little bit above the bar. Oh, oh that's what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That oh, wasn't so you were adopted. You. Right, nice. The funny thing is I've got one brown child and one white child. It's really cool. Interesting. That's mm. awesome. I'm hiding the brand because, you know. It doesn't was, matter, mate. You know, damn, you know what? You moved, you moved on. I was just about to go with the jo- uh, Postman. Sorry. Forgive me. Sorry. I had to sneeze. <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, I didn't want to. Yeah. Ah, it's all good. Mate, you know what? In these it's crazy just, times. My favorite beer, you know. Exactly. So, Dancing in the Storm, let's get back into this song because we're getting a little bit sidetracked here and it's my fault for being too silly. Um, There's a lot of good things in this song that I enjoy. Here's the gated snare. Great bass guitar tone, by the way. This is the important thing, the backing vocals. I love how you use a here we go and you keep a good constant high note as kind of almost like a drone note type of thing. Yeah. Now, is that all you singing these parts, Dale, or is that a combination? Because I believe pretty much everyone in the band could sing, right? Yeah, they all sing. Mass has got an amazing high voice. Pete can sing really high. Richard, again, really high. Even Spock sings, you know. Yeah, it was, it's all of us singing, you know. That was uh, a really hard part to do, though, to keep that up live. That here we go. But that's the key because you get this clash. You get it's the melody. Da, da, da. You get you get that. I love that. Even though it's only there for a moment. For all you musical nerds out there, that's a semitone dissonance. Gotta love yeah. those semitone love dissonance. It. Yeah, it's a similar effect to you know, um, you know, the sort of. It's, yep. been, a it's been a hard day. Yeah. Copyright infringement. <laughs> oh really? Oh no, you gotta understand every time. No, no, I do that's these... one of my that's one of my new songs we're writing. You know, we, we, <laughs> it's we're it's been a hard, everybody. Been a hard no day's one, evening. There is nobody we want want rip off. Come on. No. See what what happens. Blame a bit of blame a bit of dirt bunch. <laughs> about about twelve hours after I've done the show, YouTube sends me all these copyright things saying your monetization has been taken by such and such record company. I get like four or five emails at least per show because they're playing all really? these songs. It's just oh wow. That's the industry I'm, and where we live. I'm just looking through the book of where all these lyrics will. Oh, here it is. Here it is. So you, you got the original lyric book there. I've got the 27th of the 5th, 1988. That's oh, the original. Hang on, hang, on, hang, on, hang on. Hold that there. Hold that there. There we go. Yeah, I scratched a whole bunch of crap out of that. <laughs> I was going to say, Dale, I can see now why you keep scratching out every second see line. What I mean? yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. And this is after he's edited. You know? Now you know, Peter. These are supposed to be songs, not novellas, mate. Yeah, yeah but he's well, such a good. You know, you've got to. Yeah, you've got to throw Peter, a lot of. Go on, Dale. Sorry. No, I was just saying. Peter gave me one really incredible piece of advice. I don't know if he remembers it, but he said, "You got to write in pictures, Dale. Got to write in I, picture." Yeah, you said I that. To me. Yeah, you said that to me. Oh. Wanker. <laughs> There's a thing here, Tracy. Do you think the boys will comment directly? What, what's did I miss something in the chats? Uh, bring it back up, Adam. I mean, Mr. Carrot Man. Uh, whatever it is, like we're we're happy just to go to town and yeah. have a good time here. So he yeah. wants the carrot. Is that the carrot guy? Wow, yeah, that's the carrot guy. I just have to bring up here. BV here lives in Canada and he's watching us right now. Yeah, oh, isn't good. that amazing? Hey, no, I mean, you got, yeah. 
Like it, it would have he's, to be V Ninja. Um, I can't also, see it. It's not coming I'll up go. on my channel. Yeah, where was it? Yeah, I've got it. There you go. Tracy, me, Tracy. So if so, will you never know? But oh, there yeah. we are. There we are. Yes. I have no idea what that reference is. Sorry. City Flat, her charity. Oh, I just need getting... Oh, no. City Flat, her charity. Background on these songs. Well, her charity is the worst lyric I've ever written, and I'm sorry. I apologise to Dale and to the. I apologise to is, the world for that one. It is the worst lyric I've ever sung. I've got to it's, say, it's a nice lyric, but it's really hard to sing. A knock is never at our door. I mean, who who sings that? A gift is never sought. <laughs> It's a crazy lyric to sing. Yeah, yeah. It was meant to be a critique of of um, of uh, be beauty contests that raise money for disabled people. What a ridiculous thing! I mean, I think it's a worthwhile thing to have a discussion about, but not in a three and a half minute pop song. That's a fair statement. Well, uh, now we're yeah. now now we're really diving into uh, all of the P people love the song "Her Charity." They love hearing it. I think yeah, it's right. the sound of it. It's not the lyric, you know. Well, let's it's... have a look. Such a Smith's type of a vibe to that sound. How hard it is. <laughs> Such a great constant voice, they all too. I love that. And I, was, I wasn't allowed to use any vibrato. That's what I was just about to say. For a singer to hold a note clean like that with no vibrato has got to be a hard thing to do. Well, well these guys are really hard taskmasters. So they, had guys, a, they had a vision. And... So you guys were basically self producing in that sense, right? Absolutely. Mm. Oh, come on, you were. You always That's had your feet yeah, it's yeah the first album Alex Sadkin, the you know legendary and a gorgeous man, uh, produced it. But he, Richard and I were pains in the ass, and I'm happy for you to talk about this, Dale. But we basically ran the sessions, and Alex for the first couple of we talked to him about it, and we said, "Do you mind us doing this?" And he said, "For the first two weeks, I thought these guys, what are they doing?" And then he said, "I agreed with what you were saying, so I let you do it." But um, it, but I think it put every it put your nose out of joint, Dale, and it didn't. No, we, used to, we used to call you. We used to call you judge and jury, <laughs> 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 and that behind the back. But um, no, I, I I was happy doing the catering. You know, in, it, in the end, it, I just it was beautiful living in London and just walk around to the studio, do my vocals in the morning, nine till about twelve o'clock or something. And then I'd go shopping, and uh, I used to cater. I used to do all the catering for the boys up in, you know, in between sessions and stuff. And I, I, I think the catering budget started at seventy five seventy five pounds a day, and I took it up to about four hundred fifty bucks a day pounds a day because <laughs> I had to go and buy. Yeah, so there's this, there's a whole probably about fifty grand worth of stuff that I blew. <laughs> is, is this related to that cocaine comment earlier? <laughs> no, no, no. I, if there was cocaine on that record, I didn't see any. Never done any so, cocaine. But. For the audience who don't understand what we're referring to when we say about self-producing, so with with creating music in the studio, you generally have roughly two, maybe three people organising the session for you. Um, generally, the person who sets up the microphones around the instruments is known as the engineer and is usually a separate person to the actual producer. And so this is just a bit of music education for you guys out there to understand what happens. A producer's role is basically a band will sit there and play a song and imagine yourself, all right, back when your days in school when you would write an essay in English class, you would generally take it to your parents or to a sibling and say, hey, can you read this and tell me what you think I need to chop out of there or need to add there or spice it up with a different word or something. And that's essentially what a producer does musically. So they will go... Uh, look, you guys play. Let's. I'll just you know re use a random whatever right now. So let's say uh, one sec. Let's go plug the guitar back in here so that you can get the idea. You may be playing a song, and you might have a passage where it just goes. And I'm purely making this up on the spot. Uh, 
and the producer might go you know what those chords don't work because what you played there doesn't resolve back to the correct key that you started in and you might think hey this feels punk rock and it feels great but then the producer might explain it in a way that a couple of people said oh yeah we were thinking that but we didn't say it and they they basically play the, the person in the middle to try and balance things out and hence they're usually not let's say responsible for you writing a hit song but they help to mold the clay that's kind that's of a, a fair way to describe exactly it exactly that yeah. well let's but bowie's let's dance perfect example of that oh my god what a great you know, song. If, you, if you listen to ben, ben bowie played it to um what's no his rogers name? no, no rogers. rogers i mean it, it was a, a jingle you know let's dance to you chichum. and now being the funk thing to think to think and that's purely my you know now rogers that's a perfect example of a good producer and uh, and the, and the artists getting on together, but there are some really intrusive, fuck with producers that just come in and just have have their own vision of something. And whether it's you or not, that's the vision. It, it doesn't particularly match your your style, but yeah, that's well, what, that, that's who he is. You know, that's the yeah, risk you take with a with another producer, isn't it? They they come oh, we've and they've sat, got an idea. So yeah, we've we've sat a couple of producers. Yeah. Absolutely, because if they're not in the, if they're not in the same same page or working in the same direction as what you guys are, there's you're, you're yeah, fighting yeah. against each other, and, and all of a sudden it's not producing the music you want to produce, and it doesn't sound like you anymore. And it's like, well, pff, yeah, great. It causes it causes tension in the studio. You don't want that. There's Absolutely enough tension not. as it is. <laughs> so, so back to the point I was making. So, generally, you guys have self produced most of your records, is that in the sense of like the arrangements and all that sort of stuff? Is that right? I'd agree with that. I think Pete and, and Pete and Richard and and the band because we rehearsed those songs and we pre-produced those songs a lot would pretty much take them and it was what it was maybe different sounds but otherwise you know very rarely did somebody actually change Alex not Alex Hutkin but L A Jimmy Iovine Jimmy Iovine changed but even then that came from the actual musicians the change yeah. in 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 talk about it a song called Talk About It. Michael yeah. Beasley knows what he's talking about. Noel Rogers is king. I agree. So true. The work that he did with Duran Duran and so many artists. Oh, he's done everybody. Yeah, he's great. Yeah. Absolutely so, incredible. So Alex Sadkin, who did our first record, did um, Duran Duran. I think he did Seven and the Ragged Tiger. And the engineer on our first album actually did. <laughs> what a tie-in. He, 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 engineered that, he engineered Big Country. So. But Alex Sadkin also did. Didn't he do what you two and uh, no no Talking Alex Heads. Alex Talking Heads. he did Talking Heads he did you know he did um, speaking in tongues yeah, he did yeah. uh, and he did those he engineered those brilliant Grace Jones albums um, Night Clubbing and Warm Leatherette you know the Island and he worked with Bob Marley in the seventies so he was like this legendary figure who was living in London and um, by the time we turned up. And he went to New York to master our album after it was finished. And Richard and I talked to him and said, are you going to be okay getting back into England? You know, what's what's the deal with your visas? And he said, oh, I've got lawyers. I've got that under control. And he couldn't get back into England after mastering our record. So he had to go to Nassau to make the next record that he was producing. And, that's, and he was in a car accident and he died in Nassau. Wow. It's this chain of events. And the guy getting... driving, the guy driving the car was the engineer. You... Wow. Will Will Gosling. Yeah. You, so that's a, it's, see, a, it's I was it getting was... exhausted just hearing the run up of events, and then when you say what happened in the end, it's like, oh my god! <laughs> and we were on tour when it all went down. So we'd come back to Australia, and I remember being in London with Dale spending four hundred and fifty pounds a day on catering, and and we were just living the high life. And I, and I remember it's a Catholic guilt part of me going, we are going to pay for this. <laughs> and we came home and we had the we most the rest of our lives. Oh, it was the most miserable tour where we all had the flu for two months and in the middle of it, Alex died and uh, it was it was a disaster. Consequently, we never paid the money back. <laughs> this is all on the uh, These Here Are Crazy Times era, right? No, no, it's the first no, album. Before oh, these first, years, we, we have hopped back. Sorry, we've spoiled your beautiful that's timeline. Right, time, that's fine. So is that where the title came from then? What's that? No, 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 shit no. You just went that was just The title time. came out of the first line of Onion Skin, Spock, who always, our keyboard player, who always had that sort of the vision thing, as George Bush, Bush Sr. used to call it. He could spot 
uh, sort of artistic themes and, and cultural themes while, you know, the rest of us were down in the weeds with the notes and the instruments and the chords, he would, he would pick up the, the vibe and he was the one who said that line, we can hang a whole album off that line. He was our, he was our prophet. I'm just having a thought here because we're back to talking about this and you mentioned onion skin in the first line. I'm just going to check here. If I hit the record button, if I can actually do what we were discussing earlier. No, it's not going to work. Damn it. Okay. Can you explain to the people, Peter, what we were talking about before earlier on today yeah. before we started the show? Yeah, this yeah. classic intro, I'm going to jump to uh, another song in a minute, but you just brought back up Onion Skin. This intro here is so iconic, and Peter's going to tell you people how this came about. Check this out. I love this, right? Garage. Now, we all know that because we all know Onion Skin. It's like, is, is that your biggest hit you ever had? Well, Great Wall was the biggest hit. Great Wall's big. Okay, sorry, forgive me. I just I wanted to check. So, that iconic intro there of how that was done, and here it is one more time just to listen to. How did that happen to get that sound? Well, I, I remember the night vividly. It was at the end of two weeks of rehearsals working on new material, nothing worked. It was a catastrophe. It was a disaster. We were miserable. Yeah. It was that men at work rehearsal room, Dale. Can you remember the yeah, one in Collingwood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember exactly yeah. how this thing came about. Yeah, yeah. And so so we went, right, that's it. We're fucked. Um, <laughs> let's go out and have a meal together and we'll come back and pack our gear up and go home. So we went, we had the meal and we came back and just before we packed the gear up, Richard went, just before we go, I've got an idea. And he, and he plays it. It's the best thing. It, an hour later, the best thing was done. You know, one of the biggest songs we ever had, absolute masterpiece, brilliant. And in typical competitive spirit, so, okay, we can pack the gear up now. And just as we started packing up, look, just before we pack up, I, I've got a song as well, <laughs> and it was and Onion was... Skin. And so we started working on Onion Skin, and about two, five minutes in, after everyone went, this is going to be great, and Richard went, you know, I did this business. And all this is happening, and then everyone went. What? Let's let's learn how to say "boom crash opera" backwards and sample it. Ipo, Sharak, Moob, and and what's on the record, and what we still fire off before we play the song live is us saying "boom crash opera" backwards that into is... a Akai S nine hundred sampler in nineteen eighty eight. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> That's, That's it. fantastic. That is so cool. I still have a uh, an S three thousand XL sampler back home in uh, in. Why she's in Melbourne now, sitting in storage. So I know those Akai samplers do such cool things. I'm trying to find a way here that I can quickly record it and then reverse it somewhere so that we can. It does. It, look, I tried it before we went up tonight because I wanted to do the same thing, and it doesn't quite sound the same. But partially because we must have sculpted how we said it, it went into an S900 sampler, which is this 80s crunchy low grade. Um, piece of technology, and also Spock played two notes, so he also played the octave. And here we go, getting musical again. He played the octave below, so you've got your boom and boom, you know, these two notes together at the same time. So my, my daughter does it on a on a iPhone. Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. I, I should do I, it now. I, I, I should have the other day. I said, oh, this is, she goes, what did that mean? And I said, I did it. I said, Ari, Paul, Sharak, boom. And she played it backwards and it said, boom. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> Nowadays, you Love can whack it through a vocoder and away you go. It <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So we used, to, I, we used to make the audience chant it. Like we used to close with the song and then we'd just get a chant going and then we'd put our instruments down and just stand there. Nick Seymour <laughs> came backstage when we one night and said, oh, I really love the Hitler Youth vibe you've got going there. <laughs> 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 Fantastic. Oh, that's awesome. Um, uh, we got a comment here from uh, Marcus Woods I've been holding on to because I'm pretty sure I do know the answer to this one. Uh, Niall Rogers also produced some In Excess songs. I believe, didn't he have a hand in on The Swing? Yeah, he, he did um, Original Sin and then Nick Launay did the rest of that record. And Richard and I, were we hadn't met Dale and Maz yet and we were writing songs in Carlton and we loved – even though I think Richard would deny it now. We love that record, but we went, we can't work. With, if ever we get to work with big producers, we can't work with this guy because everyone will think we're copying in excess. And we end, Nick ended up mixing Onion Skin and These Here Were Crazy Times. 
and uh, and he became a mate. And he did some more work for us over the years as well. God he's a he's that. a genius. He's a great producer. He he certainly is. There's no question. Of it. What's, what's going on here with this comment? Uh, and so it should have been. This must have been referring to something we said before. Uh, great Wall should have been listed as the National Fucking Trust. That's great. There's so many good songs on on those records, and uh, th- another one that you've just mentioned, which I was going to do next anyway, and you'd mentioned it. I've got it all queued up, and ready to go. Is this masterpiece here? Of course. You can hear the synths were just getting that little bit better for this record. Now that's you guys doing octaves, not 12 string guitar, right? The build, that's what makes this so good is the build. It's not rushed. These are the colors that I've always wanted to see. And although I've never said it before, I love you, I need you, I need it, I love you. Once again, I would be listening to this thinking to myself before having spoken to you about this, Peter, that that was a 12-string guitar. But of course, now it makes sense with you saying that you know like the the thing when i was growing up and, and listening to what you guys are doing was i noticed that it was so far removed and different from the other bands at the time there was just there was an air and a breath that comes in the songs and the way that you guys structure your music and i appreciate it more now as an adult than what i did as a kid back as a kid it was like it wasn't that the instant gratification factor that the more heavier bands like Motley Crue and Van Halen and stuff were giving me. But now going back and listening to it now, I'm like, man, the space is just everything. And then the, the way you guys would blend that, it's so hard to so seamlessly, and I, I can say this very, very honestly, to be able to blend two guitar performances, not just in the timing, but for the tonality, to sound like a 12 string, but actually be two played performances. Hats off to you guys, man, because that's that's really, really such a great part of the sound of this band. Absolutely. Just the, the, the thought put into uh, the um, production, you know, and the thought put into the songwriting makes it, uh, you know, great to listen to. That's the thing, the thought put into the songwriting. You know, Pete, yeah. Pete used to, uh, you know, agonise over the songwriting. Just, that's, that's, that's what it is. That's what it took. There's a demo recording of this song that's better than this. And I remember it was recorded in Ackland Street in St Kilda, and you, Dale, did a bl- you blitzed the vocal. Well, Do you remember this? <laughs> well, well, this one you had to work really hard to get it. But on the demo, there was I think you were about to go on holidays, and someone was waiting downstairs to drive off, and you just oh, sang right, yeah, the yeah, thing. Just, oh, no, yeah, yeah. Right, well, well and, and, sometimes you know. Yeah. I always this, wish we could have put that out. Ah, if you can a find sometimes, it, a lot of times our demos were better. This is another part of this song that I really enjoy because I mean I'm a huge fan of vocal arrangements. I, I talk about it on this show all the time. I love harmony layering. I love unisons that occasionally work. I love octave parts. I love drone notes, and this chorus has so many beautiful elements in it. And the turnaround that the drum pattern that Maz plays just before it kicks in. I mean. Fuck that guy's a good drummer. He just, he, uh, you know. And the thing I love about this is the high part is the lead, and the harmony is the nice underneath part, which normally, as we all know, is usually the opposite way around. Not always, but usually. So yeah. for you to be pelting that out night after night, man, that must have been hard work, but still very gratifying as a band to be able to pull All, all Boom Crash Shopper songs to sing are hard work. I'll tell you that right now. Well, you can only get yourself to blame, mate, because you recorded no. in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it made me yell every chance I got in the studio. I go, why did you guys let me yell so much? Come on, Dale, can you go back and then do a couple of yells at the end? I go, yeah, boom, yeah. <laughs> And I listen to the tracks and I go, what the fuck was I yelling about? You know, <laughs> yeah. And I do, and they actually asked me to go, can you go back and do some yelling? 
And sometimes I just yell into the you know warming up and go, ah, 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 the track and then leave it in as a joke. <laughs> Peter's just sitting there looking at this going. <laughs> What's the look on your face, Pete? Come on. Well, you know, Richard produced the vocal sessions on these here are crazy times, and when and I remember after that finished, we did a session one day, and he rang up and said, "I'm sick, I can't come in," and I freaked out. Oh fuck! How am I going to do this? And um, I realised that pushing you, Dale, was a thing, yeah. but also. <laughs> It was, it was, and it's part of your style of singing that you always make offers. So even though you're saying, "Oh, why do you make me yell all the time?" You every time you roll tape, and it wasn't tape, um, there'd be some new different. offer, yeah, yeah. and and so there'd be you just rack up all these offers, and then kind of assemble a vocal from stuff that the songwriter, who was usually Richard and or myself, would never think of. And but yeah. they'd all come off uh, offers that Dale was making, so you know you, you've actually I'm blaming you, Dale. Oh, good. <laughs> but that, that's half that's half the magic of what makes these that's, songs. That's so my special. that's my genius. Yeah, that's my genius. <laughs> that's exactly it. He's owning it now. So I'm going to play this chorus one more time, and we'll just have a quick look at this. What happens vocally? So for anyone out there who likes to sing or sing along with songs, or is a singer, or or is an aspiring musician for that matter, this is a cool thing about this. So the lower part, best thing ever happened to... Sorry, ugh, my voice is not even warmed up at all. But it's the lower part, best thing happened to me, up the top, mm. you know? And, and that's hard to build out night after night. But when you go back and listen to these songs after having watched this show today, try and pick out the parts. And, and that's half of the magic about what makes this stuff so grand and so wonderful to listen mm. to. We we had a, 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 a policy, which I think Shat half the band, which was you you weren't allowed to sing thirds. You could only sing unison, no octaves, chops. or fourths or yeah. fourths of fifths, which are the same. So so if someone sang this note, da, the natural harmony you put on it is da, 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 pretty. We would never do that. We would do da, 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 da. you know, and so – it, it was starker and less sentimental, and that was so. The harmony on the best thing is is a fourth under the lead vocal, where people would normally sing a third above it. Yeah. So, and and we were really we conscious of that. the policy softened over the years, but we we were really hardcore. No, you, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but yeah, you go. Yeah, no vibrato, no chops, no licks. You can't go. Never hand. That's all. No, nah, that's too black. You're still not allowed to do that, <laughs> and I'm not allowed to bring my and I'm not allowed to bring my congas to the gig. They're terrible. Oh, no congas. <laughs> <laughs> They're my oh, least favourite instrument. Hey, oh, feeling feeling the feeling the anti drummer vibes going on now. Yeah, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. I'll tell you a drummer joke later. <laughs> Now, uh, I was actually keeping a question here that's uh, back a little bit in the chat, which I quite liked, and it would be nice to hear you guys answer this. So, uh, Jackson Phelan, I did not ignore you. I've just been holding off on this one for a little bit. And uh, look at that. That's the Dave, question. Dave had it ready too. We were oh, both ready on to this go. One. It was a great question. I like this. So, Jackson, so Jackson asks, what do you think the three essential tracks are uh, to paint Boom Crash opera, the, the Boom Crash Opera picture, but from an entire uh, an, and an artistic standpoint, not a commercial standpoint. So have you got three songs that you could pick that go, we are Boom Crash Opera, this is us, this is why we are, but from, from your standpoint, not from the commercial success side of things. Ah, oh, hang on, that's pretty hard. All the songs of Gizmo Mantra. <laughs> um, I would, for me, it would be Great Wall, um, the best thing. Uh, uh, sorry, but they're commercial successfully, and um, probably strike a match. Yeah. That that just shows, yeah, that's just a complete. Just quickly, because I can't recall Where, which album is "Strike a Match" on again. Fabulous, crazy Fabulous, no, oh, that, oh. yeah, some yeah. fabulous piece. Yeah, which we're going to get to shortly, but I'll play a little bit of that. Just Where did you hear that here fucking welcome, mate? Here we go. <laughs> here it is, right here. 
the hell? Why is yeah. the sound not coming through? Sorry, one second, sorry. What's going on here? All of a sudden I've lost sound coming out of the right place. Just give me one sec, sorry. It's saying headphone. What the hell are you doing to me, iTunes? Oh, sorry, there it is. It is coming through, sorry. Love this song. I love Strike Peter's face. I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm doing a bit of homework here on the other computer. <laughs> Is that fretless bass? No, it's Tommy Sims. What? Jazz bass. Strike a bell. Let it ring. We are all <laughs> you, you know what? Well, it gets higher and higher, but <laughs> beautiful why did we choice, stop, Dale. Yeah, why no, did we Dale stop playing this enough. song? Dale said it's oh, yeah, okay. playing it live. Why don't we, we play it live? Yeah, more, let's Dale. start playing this one again. This is really good. <laughs> You, I can't sing it at my age now. It's ridiculously <laughs> high, and it's it's like, ah, uh, oh, I'll give it a shot. I like the song. You know what? And and we, because we this have is an the album, we, go on. Sorry. Oh, we just haven't answered Jackson's question. Well, I did. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you, you do yours. You do you. Well, I, I, I almost mean. agree with you, Dale. I, I, I Except actually, for strike a match. Well, I uh, strike a match is actually one of my favourite songs too. I wasn't happy with the overblown production not mm. not your vocal but i mean we toured with that song and maz was playing it with brushes and then suddenly it had the enormous power ballad drum approach and 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 spock's fantastic keyboard parts were drowned were disappeared and it was turned into this mighty power ballad which kind yeah, of but, but spock's bits it down gung gung all those string but they're all spock oh. You just don't like the bass. <laughs> yeah, Barry. No, I don't mind. I don't mind Tommy's bass playing. It so sounds like a fretless bass. This the chorus on it. I oh, was just an amazing bass player, you know. Such a good singer. See, and and Peter's gonna hate this. I mentioned to you guys before we started the show. This for me is my favorite Boone Crash Opera album because I love the production on this record. Peter hates it and I love the sound of this. <laughs> and it's like I relate it to like see for me 1993 was such and 93 and 94 was such a great era because things were 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 like the gear was getting better, the synths were getting better, the synthesizers for those of you out there who don't know what I mean when I say synth. Um the the sounds were refining this this album here sounds so much production wise like the Duran Duran album that had Come On Done and um, Ordinary World that the one known as the Wedding Album or it was some people call it the self titled Duran Duran album because it didn't really have a name shown on it it just had the wedding picture on the on the cover. I the only the only thing song. wrong with this album that I that I picked up and I, I think probably people would agree with me is that um, Don Gaiman who produced one half and. Keith Forsey produced another half. And Don Gaiman would come to our house, house in, in Hollywood and want to hear us play whatever we'd written that day acoustically. Yeah? And we'd play that and he'd say, oh, I like that, we'll do that one. Then he'd take it away and, and do a whole production piece on it without even us being there. With samples and sequences and stuff and then we'd have to play along with that. And I think that's a thing that Pete doesn't like at all. And I, I've, I've found a little... A little weird, but you know, uh, then he sort of start pulling some of the sequences out and leave some in there as well. But um, yeah, I, I, I just found I found that a little irritating, <laughs> you know, because we had I, I would have a different idea of what I wanted to, a song that I'd written to sound like, and I'd listen to what he put together because he was a producer, and it would be a, a completely different thing, you know. Uh, a bit more softer and a bit more well produced or something. I don't know. Yeah. Do you agree with that? Uh, in part, uh, my objection to Don was that it was similar to yours that he, he never heard us play live. He never came to a gig and we never 
the songs that we recorded with him, except for Strike a Match, we did, had never played until he rolled tape. So we wrote them and they were only ever explored as acoustic songs. And uh, But it, what was interesting about the process was that he took everything on your first or second take. So yeah, there were there yeah. was stuff I played on that record where I was mucking around and then they said, thanks. And I said, well, <laughs> what are you talking about? And they said, we've got you. And I said, oh, no, I was just mucking around while you were rolling the tape. And they said, well, we've recorded all of that and you're done. Even the guitar take, the acoustic guitar on Strike a Match, which was this Ibanez guitar, was just one me playing the song once and there were passages in the middle of that song where we just went, oh, do something oh, for eight, bar. do something for eight bars, and um, and I just sort of noodled something for eight bars. We didn't know what the even what the chords. He were made him be. he made that bit up, didn't he? The the producer came up with no, that no, no, no. It was it was a it. What was great about Don was this first take thing where he would go before you become self conscious and stiff. You are actually the real you, and that's what we're going to catch. Damn. But what he did, what he what he missed was the kind of balls out energy of the band. The fact that we were very high energy, and the recordings were a little bit muted. And I think that was our fault because we were kind of falling apart at the time. And Rich was pulling away from the band. He'd just done a really great solo album, but it was a very muted affair. And he wanted us to go in that direction. He wanted Rich wanted to pull us back from sort of what we were doing live this is a funny thing because like hearing this story from you guys it makes perfect sense it puts everything into context for where you were as a band yet for me and for many other people making comments in the chats here your experience and our experience is so vastly different here because mm. uh, there's a lot of passion for this record. I mean, people have got to keep in mind that, uh, you know, you've got songs like In the Morning and Better Days, which were such big, beautiful anthemic, especially Better Days. I mean, that's such an anthemic chorus in that song. And your take on it and our take on it is just so far removed. And it's not to say we're, we're wrong, you're right, or vice versa. It's just it, that's why I love doing this show, so we can hear from the inside version. Um, you know, it's but halfway uh, through that album, there, there were the LA riots, and we got stuck right in that, you know. And um, I think Better Days came out of that, yeah. Yeah, I was me trying to do Onion Skin again and failing. <laughs> that's what it was, well, you know, funny. trying to do trying to do that yeah, business yeah. again. Because for you me, know. when I chucked this album on and I put on my revelation, which Andy's just commented on here, this sound is just so big and full and i love i know you hate this for me you hate me for this peter i love the snare drum sound on this record i love 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 that crack and some of the fills that maz plays in some of these songs are just glorious they really maz, 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 maz. Oh, maz is fucking great i wish he was here because you know honestly i like this is the thing like dave knows because he's a drummer himself I celebrate drummers and bass players so much because without them, I, I'd be shit. I'd just be standing out there twiddling and go, and no one would care. You know? I love drummers and bass players. So here we go. Oh, sorry, hang on, wrong one. Let's hit this. Here is the sound. Great guitar tone. It drives for me. Very, very Simon Le Bon type vocal there. But this era, if you don't know the al if you don't know that that same album I'm referring to, the, the wedding uh, the wedding album as it's known, very similar to some of the vocal takes on there. Johnny Marr type part there. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that. They love it in the comments. That was my idea. <laughs> and again, layered harmonies. 
man, this this song particularly just for me is like, oh man, that song has got so much character. And now this is where you were referring to up further, and I'm probably not going to hit the right spot straight off, but I'll try and find it. You were saying about how the producer would come in and play and put parts on there, and then later you go back. So if you have a listen here, the way everything opens up and the snare kicks up to a whole other level, I assume there's drum loops and samples because you can hear them at the end. Oh, there's a whole bunch of crap in there. Yeah. So with like here. I think you're putting a little rap thing in the middle. Yeah, um, yeah, it's in the middle of the song, it's a little rap thing, a little bit late thing. Love that feedback, Peter. And again, I know you've given me a hard time about going on about Maz, but that drum feel makes that so good there. It just does. Oh, yeah. By all means. I love it. I just love that sound. So then, of course, when we get to the end, for those of you who aren't quite sure what Dale's referring to about the backing tracks being done by the producer while they're out, when you get to the end of the song, this is what he's referring to. So that's back to the real drum sound. Big, nice early 90s synths coming in. I believe it's here. The extra tight snare there. Now, is that Maz or is that a loop that you recall? Maz. That's Maz. It's, and then it's, this is a loop. So is this the sort of stuff you're referring to that you guys like came into the studio and the producer did it and that was kind of the annoying factor for you? Uh, the, the, no, the, the producer didn't steal this song from us. We, we fucked no, it no, up ourselves. Didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm not, I, no, that's not what I meant. I, I, just, I didn't say it, it. all of it irritated me, but, you know, there was a, there's a song called... Uh, that, that, and then... Because Don Gaiman did that for the first half of the album, we had to go and do the second half of the album with Keith Forsey. For some fucking reason, he did the same fucking thing, and it, it, that wasn't his his motor set, you know, that wasn't his MO at all. But he went and, you know, when we had that sequence of guy in some other room, and he, they did, what's that song about railway the train? Uh, don't, not, don't let on. Don't let on. Uh, you know, yeah. and, and I thought, again, well, what, what's he going to have done? He had some guy programming stuff on it, you know, and then we had to, I'm still mates with that guy. It's Phil Chanel who uh, works with Terry uh, Amos. He's uh, a good he's guy. Really good guy. He's probably he's a great player. He I'm played saying. the organ. He played the hammer. Yeah, organ. Well, but yeah, but there's a whole bunch of other crap on there as well. You know. <laughs> uh, uh, by the way, Keith Keith Forsey wrote most of uh, some some really crappy songs. <laughs> uh, Andy, who's been coming up in the chat quite a bit, I got to tell you, Andy, I I actually called up. Peter today and then I spoke to Maz on the phone about trying to get exactly this. He says, I'd give my left nut to have some stems from this album to muck around with. I'd give both, in fact. <laughs> They're of no use to me anymore, which is funny, but like I well, tried the, the to stems get the stems are your balls. <laughs> the, well, I would love to get the stems from this record. There's so, now for those of you out there who don't know what a stem means, a stem means basically to get the kick drum on one track, the snare drum on another track, the hi hats on another track, each guitar, each vocal, everything on the multi track session, so you can mute out. And I actually called up Pete today, as in the man who's sitting there staring at his computer, trying to get the exact thing that you're asking for there Andy I feel your pain mate because I wanted to show them off on the show so we came up with a little compromise today but where are the stems what's the story I think they, were, they were thrown out the, the multis for all of our stuff got thrown out there was a there was a, 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 it was all stored in Sydney and we got a phone call one day from someone saying quick you need to get down here all this stuff is being chucked in a dumpster and none of us lived in Sydney except for Ian Tilly, and he went down there with Norman Parker, who manages Richard, and they just couldn't find anything, and it's gone. So all these – it's. but I have dats of 
all of the um, sequencing stuff that Tommy Sims and Phil Chanel did on this album. I've got dats, they're up behind me, and I bust them out every now and then and digitise them, put them in my computer so we can play the songs live, Yeah, you know, along with those original parts. And kindly enough, for your listening pleasure. Uh, uh, Dave, can you highlight Andy's last comment, please? Because that's awesome. I'm not ready to do that. I've got my computer screen in another spot. No! I'll be back in the, I'll be back in the tick while you play it. No worries, mate. So um what hey, to, oh, probably going to the little boys' room for all we know. You know what? We'll talk about something else while he's gone because I want him to be a part of this. Um, oh, no, Maz, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, I love on, that boy. I well, love here that we go. Boy. Here we go. Well, while, while we're we've got a, a question that came up earlier on from Please. Karen, um, in regards to the night that Bono came to see you in Sydney. Wow. Mm. And um, apparently, Karen was standing behind Bono at the gig, and he seemed to be really loving it. And what did he say to you afterwards? Well, turned out he came to the gig. I was at the basement in Sydney, and uh, and then management came and said, "Oh, look." Peter was had a sore back that 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 gig. Sat down most of the show, and the management came back afterwards and said, "Oh, look, uh, Bono and fucking some other guy, whoever the bass player is or something in that band, uh, oh, they Clayton. him, uh, they they came to the gig and they'd like to meet you up was at a very infamous place called Springfield's in the Cross." Yeah, oh, it's fucking cool, you know. <laughs> Bono, great. We Bonus. made it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fuck, I'm mad. Um, and we went, and he turned out to be the biggest fucking wanker I've ever met. Like, oh, what a fucking wanker. It was, it was like, dude. Tell us how you really feel, Dale. Oh, man. I mean, there are some serious wankers, but this guy was so full of himself. It was just so sanctimonious and fucking you know, so it, It's funny. I've Like, this show is called Live Streams with Famous Friends because I'm in a position because of my work that I do that I get well, to Well, next time you get you two on... Next time you get you two on, just tell them I fucking said that. <laughs> well, I, was, I don't know those guys, but like I know what you're saying. Most of the time, you meet your heroes, and they're they're fantastic. I mean, oh, he was never a hero guys, of mine. You know, he was never a hero of mine. You know what I'm getting at here, though. Like, yeah. let's say the famous people, Bowie, yeah. and occasionally they're just shits, and sometimes oh. it just happens. It was just it was it was yeah compared to all his posturing and fucking virtual scene on stage you know in the, in the, some of the songs playing the flag and everything, but as a person he was just really, really shallow you know, uh, yeah yeah anyway yeah that's the way. That, it that, goes. That, so thanks darling I, I, that, I hope I answered your question. Well, Perfect. I think Perfect you certainly answer. did. <laughs> uh, and what he said to me was, you know, Dale, your voice comes from God, you know, oh, from God, and. Uh, if you drink a bit of whiskey, you know, that my fucking accent's changed already. But he had there, that was the gist of it. While he was feed, feeding up some air hostess or something. I, I think Adam the Carrot Man's uh, been drinking too much carrot juice. He says he's got the stems to born. He'll consider giving them back. Bullshit. Yeah, exactly. He, he's, he's the guy who keeps going on about the carrots. Oh, that carrot thing. All right. Yeah. All right, so now that you're back, and uh, we just got sidetracked on another question, Peter. So, uh, we talked welcome about back you, to the when fold. you two came to see us. <laughs> Yeah. And the after party. Yeah. And Dale told us about how much he loves Bono. So, <laughs> all right, uh, before, before we leave the Bono question, like, because he's uh, Bino One Eye. Bono was really pissed that night. Apparently, he was close to the edge. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, there you go. There's, there's the dad joke for the evening. I, have, you, no, have, you heard that, have you heard that Bono joke where Bono's at some big fucking gig and he goes, Every time I clap my hands. A young person, a starving person dies and goes, hey, stop clapping your fucking hands. <laughs> yeah, it's a great joke. I do like that's that typical. One. That's typical oh. of him. Yeah. Of course it is. So here Otherwise, we go. The so, really good. Definitely. I like that they've done some great music as of many bands. So here we go into a lucky session that we've got here. So what you're looking at what here on hell? screen now, folks, is the blue track at the top is the original studio recording and the purple track underneath is the backing track that the band uses for the song in the morning. So what I've got here to show you is actually exactly what gets played on the backing track at the show. So now what that means is that when a band plays live 
and I think this is quite common, especially these days. If you go and see U2, who we just mentioned, or you go and see Muse, or you go and see Carnival, like, God, I love Carnival, but that's a whole other story. You go and see so many other bands out there. There is generally, unless, of course, they say a punk band or some band who, who says, oh, we don't play with tracks, where to, blah, blah, blah. If you've got big production in your songs, such as Fantastic Beast, we all have just been discussing this, and so we understand this music has a broader range because of what the producers did in the background and all the rest of it. You need a reinforcement track, especially like, I mean, now as Boom Crash Opera plays today, it's a four-piece band, so we're talking a drummer, a guitar player, not two, a guitar player, uh, a bass player, a lead singer with background vocals from the other three guys, which is great that you guys can do that live. But in the background, the drummer hears dunk, 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 of some form of click, and they play along to that beat, and then the band plays along with the thing as a full, com complete assembled unit. I've programmed on that keyboard right there probably four, five hundred backing tracks with the bands that I've played with over the years. So that gives a reinforcement to be able to bring back all the studio magic into a live area where you guys can hear it live on stage and go, wow, this sounds so huge. One of the things that I love about Boom Crash Hopper's backtracks is that there's no vocals on there. The band successfully does it all live, and not every band can do that. So hats off if I was wearing one to you, gentlemen, because that's really cool that all four of you guys can do that. I live. won't take my hat off. That's because, right. You don't need um, to. It's got a horrible haircut underneath. Now, <laughs> I've got a mixer in front of me, so I can blend these things through. Um, you'll be able to see if you look uh, just up here where my mouse is right now. You oh, can so see you're being technical. I'll come back. Right. No <laughs> right. So you can Go, see... Mate. You can see that the levels are changing here and I've got the same thing with the other one and I can mute things as well. So when it goes grey, I've muted something else so you know what you're looking at. So here is In The Morning with the backing track and I'll give you guys a bit of a chance to have a listen. And Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, sending this on for us, mate. It was very nice of you. Dave, you've muted the wrong track, by the way. I haven't muted anything, mate. Oh, Peter's muted himself. Okay. That's all right. No problem. I've got to mute Dale's because he's put his headphones too close to the mic. So here is the sound for you to listen to. Let's just click over here, and off we go. So I'll just mute out the track for the moment. Right now, mate, we're not hearing anything, Jace. Oh, sorry, you're not? Okay, that's interesting. Nope. Sorry, I could hear that then. Just give me one second. Sorry, folks. I've got to click something to mishap and bear with me. Sorry, I thought I had right. My bad. Hey, this is part you of the live show. Click that little microphone under your picture there, Pete. It's, there you it's go. It's not... Oh, was now, I muting it out there? You, yeah, you, you were muting, muting yourself. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, here we go. I found where the problem was. Sorry, that's something I had to set in the settings for this. Sorry about that. Okay, so now we should have sound. Please tell me, guys, have we got sound? No. We're not rolling yes. yet, are we? Yes, Beautiful. we do. In the morning, I'll take my time. So there's the original I'll track. In a days, but I'll be fine. But when you guys play live, you actually have a percussion track behind Dale there for his part while he's singing and you're playing the acoustic guitar, right? Which is on the record too. The percussion track is there. Yeah, but It's just quite quiet. Yeah. And this, so for the fans out there who've never heard it before, let's mute the original track and let you, actually, I'll just solo this, and you can hear the percussion loop that you couldn't normally hear, which is a pretty cool insight to get for the show. <laughs> So let's switch over and see if you can hear it. But I'll be fine in the morning. Got to drop. Now we'll go back and I'll put them both together. I'll take my time. But I'll be fine in the morning. Got to dry, dry, dry in the morning. You'll be on my So how did those sounds come about, Peter? Well, this was the Don Gaiman production process. The band never plays the song, has never played it ever, and you, we would get together in the garage at the studio the night before we tracked, and we would play the song on acoustic guitars, and he'd go, make that bit longer, make that bit shorter, do that bit again. And he had a programmer there who also played bass on the song. His name was Tommy Sims. And Tommy was uh, he was playing with Bruce Springsteen at the time, and he's a big name producer. In fact, you can hear him on a podcast that Jamie Liddell does. I think I've heard him interviewed. Anyway, he Tommy would just write a few notes down, and then Tommy would stay up all night and program. All he would make offers. 
he'd program all sorts of things that we would not necessarily play or would not even end up on the record. And then that would become a frame that the band would plonk itself on top of when we came in the next day and played the track. And, you know, Tommy just started grunting into a 58 microphone and into a, you know, an Akai sampler. And he came up with some string parts as well. He picked up the Beatlesque quality of the song, so he kind of went with that. Super musical guy, one and it was thing a. That I... ri- sorry, go on. Go on. I was oh, going to say thought... one thing that. Oh, sorry, <laughs> go, on, go, on, go, on. you go, you go. I just it was an interesting. I learned a lot from this that that giving, creating a shape ra- rather than just having the band play into emptiness, there was already a shape there that we could play to. And so, and so when Maz went to play the drums on this and we'd never played the song ever, ever, we'd never played it, uh, just as he was going in, he said, I don't know what to play, and Spock said to him, Ringo. Huh. <laughs> and that was it. And so Maz just rode the crash cymbal through the chorus. And that, that, was, that was how he got it. Yeah. So, like, with this here, what I really dig about this is, especially when we get up, actually, you know what, I'll say what I was going to say about the digging part. Let's just keep going with this because the, the loop changes. So I'll just... Uh, Ride the levels here, and you get You can hear it there. So I've muted out the track there. Go back just a little bit for a sec. Have a listen for the breathy part, because I'll play it one more time on its own, actually soloed. All right, and now we'll go back again and have a listen in the track. So I'll mute out the backing track and you can hear it from the original record. So during and this is what's so cool and and one another one of the many reasons that I love Maz, as you just said, he does the Ringo thing in there, but the backing track with the and all the I can't do any of that sort of stuff myself. But the beatboxing, is, yeah, the beat. Thank you, that's the word. The beatboxing is gone, and now there's cellos and strings in there, but the drums is all him playing, which is so cool. Opening. Here's the string part on its own. Attitude. <laughs> but it's real, and that's what I love about it, because you can actually hear, if you listen real carefully, I'll even turn the volume up a little bit for this, you can actually hear a bit of Dale's vocal bleeding in the studio. Oh, I haven't been bled. Yeah, but for those of you who don't know, bleeding means basically it comes out through the headphones while somebody's playing, and you can hear a bit of it coming through. You can hear it over this side. Now, that's a real cello, is it not? No, or is it a no, synth? No, that, that's it's what I mean. Program. It's all program, yeah. But it's definitely being played because, like, one of the things I was saying that on I love about, yeah. about this is that when you open this up and you have a good look at it here, so I'll just open up the track and make it a little bit larger to look at. Uh, let's see, we'll do it down here. Okay, is that you can see here that the levels are not compressed and perfectly aligned to being like one strict height. You can see it's really being played by a true human hand because like that one's quieter note, that one's a bit of a loud, oh, sorry, you, oh, you can see my mouse. That's a quieter note, that's a louder note. It's actually being played by a human. And that's a mm. cool thing, which a lot of music's lost these days, unfortunately. Mm. So... Yeah, that's, that's cool. You know, those insights of being able to hear that sort of stuff, I think, is a, a rare treat. So thank you for sending me the track, Peter. That was really cool. I'm going to shit-can the whole approach now. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, you can. I, well, what, I, what I've – I love the, the, the way it gave us a structure to play to because we were kind of lost at the time. But I can't see the point in having all this crap on a record and then you, when you play the song, you can't hear it. You go, well, if you can't hear it, turn it off. You know, well, and, of course, there's an ambience in the background. <laughs> you know, and, and, but you see, as a radio hit, though, I mean, it does something for people to listen to. Well, but it's because of Matt Dale's vocal and Mez's great drumming. Thank and, you. And, and a good and, song. And, 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 a, and a good song. It's interesting because we came back from America and the record came out and I knew we hadn't nailed it. 
And uh, Barry Devola wrote a review in Who magazine, and uh, he said, look, he was really polite about it, but he said it, it, it sounds like they didn't know what they were doing and they just threw everything in the kitchen sink at it. And to me, I, you know, I was going, well, that's exactly what happened on this record. We didn't know what we were doing. We were too lost. Too many fingers in, in the pie, really, I think. I yeah. just think there were just too many, too many people with too many ideas all having a shot at it. All, know, all, all, all trying their own thing, all, all going. All yeah, I mean, it, everyone had an agenda. Like, you know, Don Gaiman, the producer, certainly had an agenda of what, what mm. he wanted, and so did uh, the, the, the guy that doing all the sequencing. You know. and, and so did Rich, you know. Yeah, Rich had an Rich agenda. Was completely different, yeah. And we had and, Dorian. Um, Dorian was good. You know? mm. it, it, it was interesting because it, it, we were living in Hollywood. We went to make the record under the record company's noses because – they had given us such a hard time with the preceding album where they were they were complaining about Dancing in the Storm and they said, what's an onion skin? And then that record came out in America where an onion skin was quite a big song. And then they spent, they spent a year saying, write us another onion skin. And we were going, <laughs> but a year ago you were saying, what's an onion what skin? An onion? You know, so we made, went, made it under their noses. It was the worst thing we could do because you end up with just this diluted thing and uh it does sound like a band that was completely confused and also it was the year that nirvana hit and so we've got this record company guy and he's he's coming around to our house and he's talking about how he a and r pat benatar and i'm pointing at the tv going look at what's happening now stop talking about pat benatar you know that's gone it's that's over perfect point yeah you know it's over and we doing a big corporate rock record and spending hundreds of thousands of bucks and having samples and loops and extra programmers and having producers from the 1980s who, you know, Keith Forsey, who I, I love Keith, but, you know, he did Flashdance, you know, and Billy Idol. <laughs> you know, that had fucking nothing to do with the 90s. Oh, but he, also did, he did some Simple Minds crap as well. I mean, Simple Minds as well. <laughs> yeah. this, this is a true testament, this comment. Thank you, Cass Hall. This is great. You know, you guys have great songs, though, because you can strip them back to acoustic and they stand up. It's very true. I agree with you. Yeah, that's what I was, that's what I was saying in the end when Peter said, oh, you can't really hear it anyway. But, but that's what it is. It's been, been there's a, you know, like crowded out. So there's a good song. You can do it on acoustic guitar, or you can put whatever you want to it. It's still a good song, you know. It exactly stands right. up on its own, and that's exactly that's what that's what that's what makes a good song. It's got to be able to stand up in on its, its own, own right. Yeah. It can't be mm. a, it can't be you know. Oh, it works because of these tricks I've put on it. It's got to work yeah. because it's got to speak to people, and it's got to speak to the people actually putting it out there too. If it yeah. doesn't speak to you guys trying to produce the song, you're never going to be able to make yeah, it. You can't. Yeah. Well. I Sorry, you know, I, I, you know, I was I was relieved when the song in the morning arose during the making of that record because I didn't feel like we had anything, and when that one popped up, I sort of went, "Yeah, we've at least we've got this," and I could feel a connection between in the morning and dancing in the storm off the preceding record. I mean, it didn't play out that way, but at least I and it was one of those songs that you could play on an acoustic guitar and it's. Because there's only one know. song on that. There's only really one song on that album that we all played on our own by ourselves with just what we were doing live. And that's Last Place on Earth, and that's one of my favorite songs, even though it makes me cry. But that's the only song that I absolutely love on that album. I mean, I like them all because I, I think I kind of like the production on that album. But that particular song is amazing for me. That's the one you were referring to the other day, was it, Peter? No, no, I didn't talk about the last place on earth. No, I'm trying to remember. We were talking like Peter and I were talking about this this album the other day, and um, you said something about if Dale was writing the set list, there's a particular song he would have chosen. I've just suddenly uh, forgotten. Was that I? No, was nature? Look at, uh, I'd love to hear this. <laughs> no. No, it's, it, it, Dale and I disagree over the song "Look Up What's Coming Down," which I oh, I love that song, which is the it's worst great. song on our worst album. Oh, fuck off! <laughs> See, no, but th this is this is it. So um, this is. Fucking hell. Oh, come on. I'm not trying to break up Boom Crash Opera here. It's just the fact of, like, you know, different opinions. It varies. So let's let's throw this out to the people. So in the comments, I'll just play the song for, like, maybe 30, 40 seconds or so, and let's see what the audience says about what they feel. So give us, uh, you know, your score out of 10. So just give us a 1 for it's shit, and I agree with Peter. <laughs> it sucks. Or give us a 10, and we agree with Dale, and it's awesome. So let's just have a quick listen and see what the people say. 
It's always up to the people, isn't it? <laughs> Look how happy the dichotomy between you two. Well, Peter, you're losing badly here, mate. We could fall into each other's arms. Believe it's happened. Hey! You can look at the sky. Hey, you ready for it? It's a carrot. <laughs> <laughs> We finally got we got somebody here who's on uh, who's on uh, Peter's oh, side what? a little bit. <laughs> oh, fuck, <but> Chris! <laughs> Why hey. don't you like me? <laughs> oh, he, someone's a little bit on the fence. We got a seven out of ten. Could have been a single now. That's a, that's that's a bit of love there. You know, it's funny. I, I just, I just simply put this out there as a bit of a, uh, a thing for a laugh. But uh, I got to say, the people have kind of spoken. They're kind of liking this one. I'm sorry yeah, to do I'm, this to you, Peter. Peter's going to disown me after this. And he wrote the song. <laughs> <laughs> what don't you like about it, Pete? I just think it's lame, and it try, it's try hard, and it's got a whole lot of obvious plays appeals to people. You know, it's doesn't come from any kind of strong place well, that's, I think it also comes from the, 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 the point that we're all our own worst critics so um, you know everyone else will take away something different than this but yourself Peter is, is sort of going looking at this going yeah I'm not sure if I love this one as much as mm. I thought I did but I started putting this down I yeah, didn't like it at the time either I just we, we, by that stage we were desperate for songs and I went well, here's one <laughs> In my like opinion, it. though, we did just get a, a a complete win here as far as like the person with the greatest comment because he's put so much thought into this. Glenn Garland gives it a 6.25. That's a lot of thought to come up with. Well, he's, he's, on, he's, on, you know, he's, he's listened to it and he's made a good critique of it. Yeah. Well, here's, here's one from... Um, where'd she go? Kim there you go. Bungie comment. is too harsh on himself. Well, here's one here from Kim. You know, I'm with you, Peter. But great boat. You know, like it's still been chucked out there. It's still well, it's the, it's the way I delivered. I mean, it might have been a shit song you wrote, but I fucking delivered. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you did. You definitely did. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I made a lot of shit songs shine. You know, I've got to tell you. Oh, that was that was actually a lot of fun. I didn't even mean. I didn't even think that one would get such a a, a crazy reaction there, but. Uh... That was a good reaction, and I'm sorry, Peter. I got to say because I love the production on this record. I do like that song. I've, I've been I've been pumping this album for the last couple of days, and uh, just as like I went through the catalog a bit, and when I got to this song, I was just like, "Damn, I'm really enjoying this. It's fun." Still, the last place on earth is the best song on the album. So you know, in the middle of the record, Richard left basically, and he isn't on that rec- on that song. It's Spock and I playing guitars. And it's, I mean, the thing I like about it is that it's a live take with two guitar players playing together at the one time. So it has that, uh, and we learnt that off Don Gaiman, who we worked with a month or two before that, you know, just do a live take, play together. And that's what it's got. It's got that about it, but it's just not a great song. So what happened to the band between um, Fantastic Beast and Born? Fabulous Beast. Fabulous oh, sorry, Beast. sorry, fa- sorry. I'm thinking of the movie. Sorry, Fabulous Beast and Born. What happened to the band during that time? Well, we had a Give Mo- an album called Give Me Mantra. Didn't we? No, no, that came afterwards. Oh shit! Really? Oh. That was the <laughs> last record, really. Well, it was yeah. We um, uh, what happened? Uh, we made a corporate throw everything in the kitchen sink at it record that didn't really work, and so. We went, if the band's going to continue, the band has to do entirely what it wants to do and forget 
trying to play some record company corporate game. And so we made Born 21 songs in 21 different styles. And, uh, of course, it, it it both was saved us creatively but also kind of ended our career as a mainstream Australian rock band because despite the fact that Gimme was a hit single, uh, you can't do that sort of thing. <laughs> and, you know, we were making – I was making – we were recording stuff around in this room on a cassette player. Oh, it was Casio a low, and, yeah. yeah. It was a lo-fi. Yeah, where's my Casio? On purpose, everything was on. Yeah, we did it on purpose. There's my Casio. That, know, that, that, is, that features a lot on that album. Yeah. Wow. And Spock fact, wasn't there, and it was the first album with Ian Tilly on it. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So Rich is gone, Spock is gone, Ian is in, and we're making art for art's sake. And we did have an A&R. We had an A&R. We changed record labels. We had an A&R person at BMG who was right into it. Um, but by the time the album came out, he was gone. So Chris Gilby A&R the record but then was removed or left at BMG and the project then fell over. So there were two records that were meant to come out within three months of each other. The second one never came out and never has seen the light of day. Wow, so the whole album worth of unreleased material. That's correct, yeah. And then, because, I mean, we're about to hit two hours, which is going to be our limit for the mm. show today. Um, so when we go through to a Gizmo Mantra, um, I just, I'm not going to be, have time to play any tracks right now for Born. Favourite album, uh, my favourite album. Your favourite? Okay. Yeah. So if I just quickly, like, run a little bit of a track from there, what's the song that, that defines, not just that is your favourite, but, like, would be the painting, the picture of the album for somebody? It's usually the opening track, I guess. It's the first track. Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. All right, so here we Is go. Is that so the up and down, okay? Waking no. up fine. Wake up fine. Oh, that's good. Too. Oh, sorry. Wake up fine, sorry. This is from Grey My head is gone to pieces. My heart is in the middle. That guitar. My body's wrapped around me. I reach out to other people. That voice. People, <laughs> that I sometimes get tired of it. <laughs> the bass is so much more forward than the drums on this one. That's a nice comment. Great lyric. We both went to the same comment. <laughs> we did. Where is it going now? I've lost it now. Which one, mate? No, this one. Gaffo caster. Gaffo caster. <laughs> So when we go from this era of the band and we just quickly have a look at uh, what came later with the band, I mean, there was uh, the the Lost Things is just because I didn't get a chance to get around to listening to that. Is that an original album or that's a collection of older songs or what was that story there? Sorry. Um, after we did Crazy Times, we probably wrote at least an album's worth of material and recorded it but never completed it. And so the lost things is essentially that it's it's the the third album that Fabulous that Beast again? might have been if we were allowed to finish it. We were but, really deep in you know the swamp of record company interference and confusion at that point in time, which happens. So Dale exits the band and and comes back and now you guys have been reformed and uh, by the way big shout out to Andrew De Silva who I, I believe did a fantastic I was out of Australia by then but I mm. believe he did a fantastic job continuing the flame on with the band um, and then Dale comes back into the band and when did you return to the band Dale? Yeah, I don't know <laughs> uh, last year in what November First yeah. gig in October, October, first gig in October. So have you guys been writing new material that will be coming out sometime? Well, what do you call it? The problem. The problem. Yes. Is <laughs> the, in the problem way has happened. And um, I, I, what is it that Fat Tony on, says on The Simpsons? The trucks, our trucks are always moving. <laughs> I'm, always, I'm always writing and 
whether the band actually plays the songs I'm writing is another issue. And we've talked about it, but it hasn't happened yet. And this, the problem has um, kind of gotten in the way of that. Yeah. Is it something I'd, I'd, you... like, I'd like, because I'd like to go to Pete's house, you know, like I've got so much free time, but there's the problem and I, you know, I'm not allowed to, and I'd love to go to his house and li- listen to some of the stuff he's written, but he's also busy. So we'll see what happens. You know, we'll Just for those something... of you. For Sorry, those of before... you in the audience who uh, who are wondering why the hell do they keep saying the problem, the reason we keep saying that is because the current situation... Algorithm. In, yeah, the, the, the situation that we're in worldwide right now with everyone being locked in their homes and stuff is the thing that we refer to as the problem on here because, unfortunately, YouTube and Facebook have this algorithm which will actually stop our shows from being able to get out, so we have to call it the problem. So sorry the about thing. that, but that's just what we have to do. Um, uh, sorry, what were you going to say, David? So... Would you? Do you guys want to put out more music? Do you want to put out another album? We did. We did a couple of new songs on a col- best of collection a few years ago, which were I thought were great. I thought they were really good, and um, so yeah, we're we're playing better than ever, and uh, we know so much more about how to make music now than we did when we were floundering around in our twenties. I'd love to do more stuff. Here's a question that uh, somebody's asked that I was actually curious about, and I know fans are going to want to know, so this is why the question's here, and you guys can answer it however you wish. Is there any chance that Richard or Spock would return to the band? When we did the two new songs a few years ago, I mean, Spock was still playing with us then, and Richard played on that stuff. We also did an acu- one of those Liberation Acoustic Records in 2009, yes. and Richard produced that and played on that. I, I keep saying the band is a family. Even when, Dale, you were out, I kept saying the band is a family. You don't, it's like the, it's like the mafia. You don't, you know, you, you, you can't leave. Once you're yeah, in, you're always in. Yeah. yeah. You know, and Rich and I have started writing again, writing together again while you were away from the band, Dale, and this, that stuff is sitting there. You know, waiting to be plucked, as it were. Oh, okay. So long as it's not like you know. Oh. See, he played hard, cello on it. The hard <laughs> thing. Richard, 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 Richard played did. the wow. cello, and I played the piano. So long as it's boom play short music, I'm happy to sing it. You know, yeah. Like, the, the thing that I, fans I have a hard time understanding. Thing, you know. Sorry, sorry to talk over you. The thing that a lot That's of fans right. don't understand, and we get this vibe when we talk to a lot of different bands, is that. Like being in a band, and Dave and I know because we've both played in bands together and with other people as well, is it's just the same as being married, except, you know, it's hard enough being married to one person. Try being married to three or four or five other people, mm. depending on the size of your band, and it's hard. Sometimes things get said that you – sometimes I've said things. I've, I'm very guilty of this myself, and Dave is already nodding because he knows what I'm going to say. I've been very guilty of saying things that, to me, at, the, at that moment, was like about as dangerous as just dropping that guitar pick. But to the person that I that I said it to, it was like dropping a ton of bricks on their head, and and those things can sort of carry through and hurt people. And, yeah, well, that's that used to be, but at the moment, in the line, you know, it's it's like the best band I'm in. <laughs> it's, it, there's, there's none of that. There's just none of that stuff going. It's just just everyone's having so much fucking fun. You know, it's just it's just a pleasure to hang around with these boys. You know, that, that all that stuff happened about fifteen years ago with all that rubbish. You know, and with us fighting and there was, there was all that typical band bullshit. But, you know, I joined the, back in the band and it's like, wow, I really miss this shit, you know. I, and it's I been meant, really good fun. I meant to bring up what Dave just had highlighted there a second ago about the uh, Red Hot Summer Tour. That, I mean, obviously things got stopped during the middle of that, but, like, I believe that was doing really, really well for you guys, right? Yeah, it was doing well for everybody, you know. It was great, Um Lots, lots of there was all house fools, you know. Hunters and collectors were really good. James Rand, all the bands were great. It was good fun for us. We, we love opening because we were really good at it. <laughs> so hunters and collectors were bought because I mean, keep in mind, remember, I'm in Japan, so I unfortunately didn't get all the press and all the rest. I only found out about the uh, the tour recently. But uh, hunters and collectors reformed just for that tour. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, that is so cool. Big band. Oh yeah, I I play with Jack in other bands around town, you know. So I know Jack Howard. Well, we all Maz and John 
basically Mark Mark Seymour's band is the rhythm section from from Boom Crash Opera. Well, John Favaro Boom- is what he's talking about. Yeah, our yeah. bass player. Yeah. Your current yeah. bass player. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And and um yeah so if you remove Mark and remove Cam his guitar player and put me and Dale in then suddenly you know there we look when I started in music the the, the one of the first people I uh, pers- persons I met was was Mark Seymour and his brother Nick and so I've been connected to those people and to that crew since you know the beginning of the eighties the ballroom days the ballroom days we're back at the beginning we are. Do you like that? Do you like that? Did you like that? We've tied it in a bow. (laughs) Yeah, we've tied it in a bow. Which means that we are essentially done. (laughs) 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 I mean, that's that's really what we've gotten down to. But is is there anything that you guys want to uh, make the fans aware of or tell them or say to them? I mean, you've got an audience of people. We've still got 129 people right now watching and people coming and going and what have you. This is Well, for me, it's like, you know, that, that that I can keep doing it. Uh, and people are enjoying it. Well, that's kind of the best, the best feeling for me. And um, as long as they enjoy it, I'll keep doing it. You know, and I hope everybody else feels the same way. Peter, oh, it's a special. No, I've got. I don't know. I'd be making some motherhood comment. It is. I'm lucky to be in a band that had some impact on our culture, and it's a really, it's a privilege to have created those songs and have that place. So I love, you know, I love the fact that we can still do it. That's a pretty cool thing. Somebody just said back here, I just missed the comment because the comments are moving too fast. I, I'm sorry. I, hey, here it is here. This person says that you helped to get them through their cancer treatment. Mm. Well, That's pretty I'm awesome. Glad you, I'm glad you're better. You might you might want to listen to the song um, off uh, the, that new song we did a few years ago, You Can't Stop the Sun, because that's specifically about getting through cancer because we are all of a certain age and we're all now dealing with things like that. Yeah. Yep. That's, yeah. But There's I'm that glad somber that note. Through. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, Let's go back to ballroom, 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 ballroom. <laughs> la, 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 la. I'm not um, going to end on that. I'm trying to think. What, what's going to be a nice, fun song to take the show out tonight uh oh there mate carly's just coming a nice little comment for me dale your voice is still amazing thank you carly oh i can't do those licks i was gonna say none of those licks in this (laughs) man (laughs) he's off the leash tonight there's the casio Uh, play dirt i just realized what i'm going to finish with finish what oh what song i'm going to take out the show with Oh, whoa! Impress me, well, Jason. I, I just, I just impress us it. all. <laughs> hey, am I supposed to read? Am I supposed to read this text message I just got out live on the air? Let me just double check this. Hang on. Oh, what is it? The rock mistress is watching, as in your manager. She said, "Tell him." <laughs> That's what she said to <laughs> say. Beck, your manager just messaged me and said to tell, G'day, tell you Becky, boys yeah. that the rock mistress is watching. I gave so, her a plug earlier. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, folks, I would like to thank you all very, 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 very much for being here. Um, I haven't even told Dave, my co-host, yet because this just happened. Coming up on the show on Thursday, when we do our non-Australian shows, we normally do a, a couple of other shows during the week, which are at 10 a.m. Melbourne time because in Los Angeles it's 5 p.m. In New York it's 8 p.m. So that's usually our time for doing the show. Coming up on Wednesday night for the Americas and Thursday morning, 10 a.m. in Melbourne time, and you can figure out the rest of your times from there, we have a very cool, special blend crossover show. We have Dave Amato, lead guitar player from Ario Speedwagon, who also, for all of you Australian music fans out there, played guitar with Jimmy Barnes back in the uh, freight train heart and uh, barnstorming era and all that when they had Johnny Diesel on guitar. The other guitar player was Dave Amato. He was also playing with Ted Nugent, and uh, he's an awesomely good dude. Dave has one of the best guitar collections you will ever see in your life. Gibson TV, as in Gibson Guitars, has a video out that I watched uh, yesterday, and they go through some of his collection, and it's ridiculous, some of the stuff he's got. So him, together with Ricky Phillips, who is the bass player, from uh, from Sticks, 
and also played in um, 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 Bad English with Neil Sean and basically it was half of Journey and part of Sticks all together. So we've got those two guys. They're best mates. They're going to come on the show together, Dave. How cool is that going to be, huh? That's pretty awesome. Love so, love me some Sticks. Oh, yeah. So Sticks and REO Speedwagon blend over show coming up. So 10 a.m. Thursday morning coming up next week, uh, Melbourne time. Please work out the rest of your world times. I'll get the poster done soon and pump it up. <laughs> the website for our show, as you can see up in the top corner just next to Dave's head there, is LSWFF, the acronym for the show, dot com. And, uh, yeah, we've got some other things I'm trying to just get nailed out for next week, so I can't really announce the rest of them yet because they're not quite there. So, Dale, Peter, thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. It's been wonderful having you on the show tonight. Um, ah, last it has thing, been awesome. Quick- yeah, it has been. Last thing has I want to quickly awesome. mention, because I said I can't monetize this stuff, if you're watching and you feel that you wish to, there is a link in the description on YouTube and Facebook where we have a uh, a PayPal link that if you want to drop in a donation, thank you. And if you don't, it's cool. We appreciate you being here and watching the show anyway. We don't put pressure on that one. We just let people know it's there. So, um, yeah, thanks, guys. It's really thank been you. special. we got <laughs> a, such an in-depth history of the band, and I thank really you. appreciate it. Thanks to both of you. No, thank Been you nice. very much yeah. for your time, mate, though. Look See you, Dad. forward to uh, seeing you back out See you, Now, before you guys hang up, we'll do the out to the show, and then we'll just come back and just have a little private thanks at the end of it. But uh, I think it's pointing to play this particular song because we are all looking forward to when these return. I know what it is. Of course you do. <laughs> it's just too obvious, isn't it? Oh, no. I thought it was going to be, get out of the house! <laughs> That's what my wife said, you know, he's going to play, get out of the house! No, <laughs> better days. Thanks folks for watching, bye bye! <laughs> she asked me what have you been